Demos do Mix. Well, I have 15 parts, so I'll Okay. All right, we're getting ready to start an item that was time certain, so we're going to go back to item 5B, which is the operation of the Brevard County Golf Courses. And um, Commission, with your um, permission, what I'd like to do is to move in this order so because there's so many aspects of this, is the county would make a presentation, then the Golf Advisory Board, the Savannas and then the um, Golf Brevard, and then we'll do public comments. And um, commissioners, I thought what might be appropriate is the three entities that are bringing presentations is if we would allow them 10 minutes for their presentations. Is that agreeable? So, okay, and then we'll keep public comment at the amount of time that it is. We do have 15 public comment cards. So for um, time's sake, it's going to be a while. If, if you hear something that's already been said, you can say I agree with that or, or however you um, need to do it. But if, if you would just kind of keep that into consideration. So, um, Ms. Donner, I think I'm going to turn this over to you, ma'am. Good evening, Commissioners. Mary Ellen Donner, Brevard County Parks and Recreation Department Director. Uh, this is a continuation of an item that was heard at the October 24, 2017 board meeting. And the action requested is it's requested that the board review and discuss the attached PowerPoint presentation and provide direction to staff on how to proceed with the three county-owned golf courses. As you may remember, the county entered into an agreement with Integrity Golf, and as of July 31st, uh, they had breached their contract, and uh, we then went to having IGM in a temporary month-to-month -month run the golf courses on behalf of Brevard County. Uh, Krista Fitch and Associates was uh, contracted and brought a report to the Board of County Commissioners on that same date, October 24th. And uh, we also entered into an agreement November 1st for Christovitz and Associates to assist with stabilizing and elevating the level and consistency of customer service and assist the county with overall facility and course presentation. The board action uh, that was directed on uh, the October meeting was that we were to enter into an agreement with Christophitz and Associates, which we did, directed the county attorney to take legal action against Integrity Golf, and tabled the board decision regarding the golf course for 60 days. Throughout the months of October, November, and December, Staff met with various interested parties to uh, evaluate and uh, get input on what they thought might be possible alternatives and options for the three Brevard County golf courses. We met with Savannah Partners, Golf Brevard, Jet Firm, Steve Lamontagne from Suntree, and we've been talking to Amy Gregory, who is an assistant professor with the University of Central Florida. Uh, Mid-October, uh, the staff, the Parks and Recreation Department staff, actually went out and assisted the golf courses with uh, maintenance and operations to, to assist with the golf course presentation. Such things as maintenance building, repairs, drywall painting, we put up fences, um, repaired lighting, just various things that over the years uh, we thought needed a little more TLC. So this next slide actually uh, identifies what the Golf Enterprise Fund balance is as of the end of December 2017. These are actuals that went through the end of, of the, the, the calendar year. And I think that the important thing to note is that the Golf Enterprise Fund at the end of December had $195,000 in it. And 104, so we'll just round it to, to 195. What we actually did was we took that first quarter actuals, we projected the 
second, third, and fourth quarter through the end of the fiscal year. And we came up that the Gulf Enterprise Fund is anticipated to have approximately $71,000 by the end of fiscal year, September 30th, 2018. We looked at um, how did we get those projections. We, we looked at the projections of number of rounds that we expect to have at each of the three golf courses. We looked at the anticipated revenues. We looked at the anticipated expenses, and that's how we came up with the $71,000, 280 that we expect to be left in the Gulf Enterprise Fund by September 30th, 2018. There's been some discussion regarding capital improvements at each of the golf courses. Um, the Savannah Partnerships, from which you'll hear a presentation from a little bit later in the evening, um, had estimated without a cart barn roof at the Savannahs that they would need one to $200,000 of capital investment at just the Savannahs. Christovitz and Associates in their report actually <laughs> estimated year one, year two, and year three by golf course. And our facilities management, our county facilities management went out and took a look at what perhaps they thought might need to be addressed in the upcoming years. The first of four options, uh, we actually have a total of eight options, but the first four options with editorial license are presented as outlined in the Christovich October 13th, 2017 Operations Review and assessment, Asset Assessment Report. The option one is effective disposition of golf courses, course or courses. For your consideration on option one is disposition of the Savannah's course, disposition of Spessard Holland course, and or disposition of Habitat golf course. I think that one thing of note on this slide that I might in mention is, um, is there mentions a long-term lease, and that long-term lease is defined as 15 to 29 years. You have on the next slide what, what we what some of the pros and cons are with regards to option one. Option two is to continue to own and operate all three courses. If the board were to consider this option, there are two sub-options under this option. One would be the county running the course and contracting out maintenance. This was the model for probably 20 some odd years prior to actually engaging with integrity. The second option under this option would be for the county to run both the pro shop and the maintenance um, so they would run the entire, the entire course, not contracting maintenance out. There are some pros and cons for each of those two models under option two of having the county run the courses. Option three is to continue on, to own all three courses and outsource to third party management. One thing that I'd like to point out is uh, we, we have a, sh a term in here, a short term lease. A short term lease is defined as a lease less than 15 years. Here are some pros and cons. If the board were to consider continuing to own all three golf courses and outsourcing to a third party management. This was the model under which integrity was engaged. The fourth option is to divest of the Savannah's golf course and retain or operate Spessard Ho Habitat and Spessard Ho Holland and Habitat. Here are pros and cons for option four. Option five is a public-private partnerships a partnership with Savannah's. Uh, Savannah's partnership will be presenting their public-private model uh, later in this evening. I believe the chair actually mentioned that they would be, I think, last. 
No, at, right after the Gulf Advisory Board. Excuse me. And here are some public-private partnership Savannah partners, pros and cons. I think the, uh, one of the items to note on this particular slide is that this option could count, uh, cost the county 200 to $230,000 per year. And how we arrived at that figure is we um, took the uh, requested $70,000 per month payment to the Savannah's partners deducted what would be the revenue because that for a period of time would come back to the county. So that was until such time that they are cash positive. And so this option would cost, could cost uh, 200 to $230,000 a year. And the Savannah's partners actually um, had uh, requested that perhaps for year one, a capital investment by the county would be anywhere from a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. Option six is the establishment of a community development district. A community development district is a local special special purpose government framework that's authorized in uh, Florida statute. Um, one of the things I think to note, uh, there is a secondary development that is in the area of, of the Savannas that may be interested in partnering with a CDD, but it's anticipated that this um, the second developer might not be um, even ready to begin construction anywhere from 18 to 24 months in the future. Option seven is a public-private partnership for Spessard Holland and Habitat. You will hear a presentation from Gulf Brevard. They will be presenting their public-private partnership model. It would be uh, similar to that as the Baltimore model um, that had five courses that was turned over to a not-for-profit to run. Here are a number of pros and cons for the public-private partnership for Spessard Holland and Habitat. Option eight is the Brevard County Golf Course Advisory Board recommendation. Uh, the, at their December 14th meeting, they recommended that the Board of County Commissioners consider having public-private partnerships run the Savannas and separately run Spessard Holland and Habitat. Here are some pros and cons of the Brevard County Advisory Board. Um, I think it's important to note that at, at, um, there are decision points that we have assist, tried to assist the board with. Um, if you were to pick any one of these options or combination of these options, um, there there would be some things that the that the county staff would ask that you consider to help us go forward with implementing these options. And a lot of those board decision points are at the end of each of the option slides that we just reviewed. So the consideration also is that should the board choose an option that requires the county to maintain, operate, provide capital investment or monetary to monetarily compensate another entity for one or more of the golf courses, it's requested that the board authorize the county manager to utilize up to $400,000, up to, up to $400,000 of county reserves for any necessary expenses. And a number of the things that we have looked at is, you know, going forward, um, there may be unexpected maintenance and or repairs that are unanticipated. There may be operating or, or weather complications like we saw this last week when it was extremely cold and, and rainy and golfers, uh, golfing was significantly decreased. There might be, um, such as uh, pumps that may break or air conditioners that may be replaced, um, but it's important to note that we would not spend any of this money unless it was absolutely necessary. And in closing, it's requested that the board provide direction to staff on how to proceed with the three Brevard County-owned golf courses, Savannah's, Spessard Holland, 
and habitat. Thank you, Ms. Donner. Commission, do you have any questions or are we ready to go to the next presentation? Okay, if the um, Gulf Advisory Board would come forward. Good evening. I'm Anna Cook, Chairman of the Brevard County Golf Advisory Board and a representative from the Habitat Golf Course. The Golf Advisory Board, the board that you appointed to represent the golf playing public in Brevard County, has worked tirelessly in the past several months to come up with a solution to be able to maintain county courses for the golf playing public of Brevard County. Catch my breath. Considering the fact that 1.1 million rounds of golf have been played in this county in the last 10 years, I think we can safely say that golf is a much used asset in Brevard County. After much discussion and timeless hours, the Brevard County Golf Advisory Board recommends that the Brevard County Commissioner first enter into a public-private partnership with Savannah's partnership to operate, maintain, and improve the Savannah's golf course with an option that a CDD may be considered in the future. And second, that the county commissioners enter into a public-private partnership with Golf Brevard to operate, maintain, and improve Spessard Holland and Habitat golf courses. We have two distinct groups who have volunteered to step up with solutions. We respectfully ask that you take action to enact these measures and in, engage in negotiations as soon as possible. Thank you. Savannah, are you ready for your presentation? For the record, my name is Fred Shea. I live at 5935 North Tropical Trail on Merritt Island, Florida. I want to thank the Commission for time uh, this evening and also want to thank the staff for their support and also recognize all of the golfers and residents of Savannah as they're here tonight in support of our efforts. Um, um, we're, we are here tonight to talk about a public-private partnership between Brevard County and Savannah's partners for the sole purpose of sustaining the Savannah's golf course for the long term and returning it to profitability. The current situation is, uh, as I like to describe it in the business world, Savannah's is in a death spiral. Rounds are declining. They've declined 43% over the time period shown. At the same time, Brevard County population has increased by 45%. So a group of us got together and said, there's something going on at this golf course that's contrary to the trends in the golf industry in the United States and in particular in Florida. Um, revenues have, have not uh, met expenses and uh, uh, just about every stakeholder is dissatisfied with the situation at the Savannas. A group of us got together and decided that we wanted to look at uh, the Savannah situation in earnest. So we spent uh, three months gathering data, uh, talking to people, socializing this with the uh, county staff and with uh, people in the golf community here in Brevard County. And uh, at, at the end of that, we developed a business plan. And that business plan shows that we can, that Savannah is viable uh, and the key to that is a partnership between a group of inter interested citizens who are willing to donate their time and invest their money and, it's, and between the Brevard County and between the homeowners. As a partner, we're asking Brevard County to 
basically uh, make the course marketable, is put it into handover conditions so that the Savannah's partners can aggressively market this property and value price it. And we're also asking the county to support us in transition funding uh, because the, we're below break even and it doesn't look like we can get to break even for the first year or year and a half. Savannah's partners uh, will manage all the golf courses autonomously with only oversight from the county. And we'll provide all the startup expenses and do all of the marketing funded by, uh, by part of, uh, of our revenues. The Savannah's Homeowners Association will be responsible for uh, structures and golf course beautification so that we can uh, value price the property and for ongoing funding support and assistance in marketing. I might note that the Savannah's uh, Homeowners Association is one of our partners and has contributed investment money. Our plan of organization is to have a, a board of directors consisting of all three partners. They are responsible for fiduciary matters, policy, and oversight. Two business management teams, one focused strictly on marketing and the other focused strictly on operations. All volunteers, no salary. The financials that, uh, that we have are uh, year one through year five, growing rounds up to 40,000. Remember this course has done over 40,000 in the past. Um, and our break even is at 30,000 rounds. The county's break even is at 36,000 rounds. Our break even is lower for several, for several reasons. And at 36,000 rounds, our models show that this is 100% self-sustaining and capable of paying back loans and investors and other things, at least starting that process. Now, any good business person wants to know what's the best case, what's the worst case. So the best case is that if we can get the partners to work together, we reach 30,000 rounds in year one, we minimize our transition cost. The worst case is that we flatline, that despite all of our efforts, we cannot bring this property back to profitability, in which case Savannah's partners will pull out and the county will be faced with, this, with uh, probably not some pleasant choices. I think if we work together aggressively, that's very unlikely to happen. But it is always a possibility. Uh, cost to the partners. Uh, we've estimated the cost to the, to, the, to the county for golf course improvements at $200,000. Um, <coughs> structures, I took that number from a staff report that I received on Thursday. It's subject to discussion and subject to uh, reevaluation. My personal belief is that, that 900,000 is too much money. I don't, I don't think the business could, could uh, justify that. And of course, to provide uh, transition funding, which is repayable. Savannah's partners will put in uh, $150,000, 30,000 for course improvements, um, 20,000 for structures, and uh, 100,000 for transition expenses, basically startup costs. And the Savannah's Homeowners Association would, uh, would contribute as well. In summary, you will not find a more motivated or passionate or working partner uh, to help this golf course. We're local golfers, we're willing to put our investment money in, into it, and we're willing to do the work with no pay to make this uh, golf course uh, profitable again. And I believe that it satisfies all the stakeholders. Um, there is, uh, I'd like to ask you to consider your support for uh, this initiative. And with that, I'll take questions. Commissioner Snorty. Yes. A couple of questions. Um, just, I mean, without going into an excessive amount of detail, just off the top, what what ideas do you have different that Brevard County has tried in the last 20 years that are different, other than you asking Brevard County to make 
investments. I know you said you'd come off the 900,000 or mm -hmm. that you would be open to that, mm -hmm. but course improvements of over 200,000 and the structures, um, even if it's half that at 450,000 or whatever, mm -hmm. what, what do you, what is the, what are you going to do differently to help other than marketing? Because I think we've tried that for a couple right. of years. There, there are, the number one thing that golfers care about is course condition. That, that condition. And location, been, probably. No. Not location? Course, course condition. Number uh, one, location's not even on the list of the top ten. Course condition is number one. Pricing is number five on the list. So we want the course condition to be as good as we can afford to make it to attract uh, golfers, because that's their number one concern, and to allow us to value price. The more we can price the golf course up, the better it is for all of us. So the second thing we'll do is we're going to manage the Savannah's golf course with a business, with a uh, private business perspective as opposed to a county perspective, with all due respect. Right. Uh, we've looked at the expenses. We think that, uh, that there are many places to improve the expense uh, profile. So we'll cut expenses fairly dramatically, particularly in the transition period. And we'll get the course condition into uh, attractive uh, shape. And then we will market it. I think that's going to make a big difference. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Smith. Mr. Gray, you had mentioned that the homeowners were willing to be partners. What, yes. what is their, what's their financial uh, investment in this? What are they willing to pay? So they are a partner. So they're putting up a partner share investment, and they have uh, committed to uh, representing their homeowners for ongoing funding. That level has not been determined. I would defer that question to them. Okay. I thought you, um, I thought I heard somewhere that they were willing to be a ten thousand dollar partner. Is that correct. correct? That is correct. They've committed to that. Ten thousand total. Pardon me. Ten thousand dollars total. Correct. Yes. I, I have a question for you. You said that um, you're going to try to cut expenses right away, and I know you're asking for a guarantee of seventy thousand. So if you cut expenses, that'll be less of a liability on the county. Yes. As we move forward, also, and yes. um, this is important to me. And I mentioned this yesterday because you had talked about the handover cost, and you said, you know what, that's not accurate. I can kind of get it down. Can you give me an idea of what you think a reasonable number would be there? That's going to help me a lot with this tonight. I think it's, I think it's under easily under five hundred thousand okay. dollars. There's only one okay. joker in the deck, if you will. Okay. And that is the the deck on okay. the Savannah's clubhouse. We don't have a firm number on that. I know staff has provided a number. We personally have looked at it. Uh, haven't had time to do a full evaluation, but I don't think a complete re uh, demolishment and uh, and replacement is in order. I okay. think it's a re-roof. So down from nine hundred thousand, we're looking at five hundred thousand. I'm I'm I won't swear to it, but I'm telling you, if we work together with staff, we'll get that number down. Okay, and if, if we made you commit to that, you'd find a way to do yes, it? Yes, I'd find a way to okay. do it, absolutely. Okay, Commissioner Isnardi, is your light back on, ma'am? Yes, I just um, have a question, maybe perhaps for you too, so if you could just stay there for one more second. Mary, um, Ms. Donner, how much this year have we made in capital investments for the Savannahs, or as far as expense goes, other than outside of the normal operating? Didn't we just do a little bit of capital improvements over there in that clubhouse? Well, we did, actually. Um, uh, in October, when we went out, and it, it, I wouldn't necessarily call it capital, but we actually spent <clears throat> per golf course. Uh, let me just get that number for you. Under fifteen thousand dollars. I can get you the actual breakdown if okay. you would like that. Um, Commissioner, the repairs that uh, we're referring to are, we went out there to repair the maintenance facility because it was in disarray. We painted it, uh, fixed the inside of the clubhouse, put up some fences that had been blown down over the, from the hurricane, and j just did minor repairs. 
and so, about fifteen thousand dollars. So for the savannas, we spent approximately fourteen thousand dollars. For Spessard Holland, we spent about sixty-six hundred dollars, and for Habitat, we spent about ninety-six hundred dollars. Okay. Um, and other than that, in one of the slides that you uh, you had. <laughs> Um, you see that we had replaced some pumps at the Habitat. We had replaced some air conditioning units at Spessard and at Habitat. And we did a little bit of boiler work at Spessard as well. So I would say it's in the, in the realm of about under, under $40,000 for all three courses. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Barfield? Um, how much would you say has been put into the golf courses um, uh, and the capital improvement over, say, the last 10 years? Was the still been going? The uh, irrigation system at the Savannas is, is the large investment that we did out there at the Savannas Golf Course. Did a little bit of uh, just a little bit of uh, cart path repairs. Limited at that at the Savannas and at the other locations, it, it's limited capital investment. The uh, clerk of courts actually submitted a, an estimate um, that, you know I've got this thing tabbed, but I should have color coded it. Um, Um, so for the last, uh, since 2006, $10.8 million um, was to satisfy the annual debt. Um, there was some operations and maintenance. Uh, the Savannas was a million three. Habitat was a million six. And Spessart Holland was 968,000. And those numbers actually came from uh, Mr. Ellis's office. Ms. Donner, I'm sorry, over what period of time? Ma'am? That was from the fiscal year 2006 uh, to 2016. Thank you. Commissioner Barfield? Yeah, but that's not necessarily capital improvement. That's general fund, correct? That, that was debt and oper operations and maintenance. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Golf Brevard? Your name, sir, for the record. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Tom Becker. Um, I live at 735 North Highway A1A in Indy Atlantic. And thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. Um, the issues at, Savan at Savannah's are very different from those that we have in the two South County courses. Um, for years, South County golfers have said, just, just get rid of Savannah's for us and let us operate with just the two county courses. Um, because they saw hundreds of thousands of dollars that were earned at the two south courses going north to the Savannah's over time. Um, and what that did was prevent Habitat and Spessard from meeting their own maintenance needs. Um, we have as, uh, we have as Golf Brevard, um, a purpose and that purpose is to provide Brevard County Commissioners a proposed concept for retaining the Habitat and Spessard Holland golf courses as affordable, aesthetically pleasing, well-maintained golf courses in a manner that creates long-term financial stability while ensuring affordable access to all Brevard County residents and visitors. I think the purpose is a laudable one, and I think it's also one that is attainable. Um, the goal that we have, the overarching goal through Golf Brevard, 
is to establish a nonprofit 501c3 corporation for the purpose of managing the operations, marketing, and short and long term strategic planning for the Habitat and Spessard Holland golf courses. The concept is modeled after the uh, successful Baltimore Municipal Golf Corporation. Um, golf Brevard is not an organization right now. Golf Brevard's a concept. Um, the Golf Advisory Board met six times after the October Commission meeting to consider alternative solutions to your Commission's re uh, concerns. The unanimous conclusion was to that was that the that Brevard County pursue relationships with public-private partnerships and that these were the preferred model. Golf Brevard formed in response to what the Golf Advisory Board came up with for its recommendations. And it was formed to consider the feasibility of operating the two South courses under a 501c3 nonprofit corporation, similar to the model used by the city of Baltimore. Baltimore used a nonprofit corporation governed by a volunteer board of business leaders, golfers, and a county representative, city representative for them, that assumed operational control of the city's five declining courses in 1985. They were losing at the time approximately $500,000 per year. Um, the best opportunity for long-term success, they believed, and we believe now too, is that one, management decisions are removed from the political process, and two, all revenues from the courses are reinvested in operating, maintaining, and improving the courses. Has Baltimore had problems? Of course they have. In addition to national golf trends, they've lost 25% of their city's population. The inner city itself ends up being a problem for their golf courses because they have trouble bringing people to their golf courses because people fear for their safety when they're playing. And the city's raided millions of dollars from the golf course funds to bring them back into the city's, uh, the city's operating funds. Um, I hope you recognize the difference between the demographics that there are for the city of Baltimore and what we have here in Brevard County. And I hope that if, as we develop an agreement, that you will help us take measures that prevent Brevard County in the future from coming back and taking funds earned by the courses back for the general fund because they need to be there to take us through the difficult times that we'll have as well. The executive director of the Baltimore Municipal Golf Corporation has been employed by that corporation since inception. He wouldn't change a thing as far as the structure of the organization. What he would do differently is have a better relationship with his landlord, which is the city. Golf Brevard, um, Golf Brevard would be a 501c3 corporation, would assume full managerial control. It would be governed by a rotating, perhaps seven member voluntary board of directors. The courses would be managed by a professional director of golf reporting to the board of directors. The director of golf would have full operational and maintenance, maintenance responsibility and accountability. And any and all revenues generated above expenses would be retained for future improvements. What are the steps that need to take place? First, the county would lease two golf provide um, at a nominal fee the two golf courses. Second, the county would retain responsibility for paying Valkyria Airport for lease of the habitat land. The lease is a county, Brevard County to Brevard County payment, with golfers having subsidized pilots and aircraft owners for the past 25 years. Habitat is the only one of the three county courses that's been required to pay for its land. The approximately one and a half million dollars golfers have paid to subsidize the airport operations is a contributing factor to today's quandary. There'll be a sizable shortfall in revenue from April to November 2018. A grant or loan or combination of the two will be necessary to cover transition year expenses. These expenses are already included in the county's projections on page nine 
of the presentation that they made this evening, which still shows a balance remaining of $71,000. The county will need to provide or arrange a line of credit to allow correction of deferred maintenance issues that have been allowed to accrue over time. Um, and legal and staff assistance in a collaborative manner with all helpful information shared proactively so that we seek win-win solutions. If we're going to be partners, that's what we need to do. Next steps. Next steps would be a decision this evening to continue to pursue or to pursue um, a, an agreement with us where, uh, whereby um, there would be a reasonable time provided for development of a business plan and negotiation. Uh, and that Golf Brevard will develop, then develop a full business plan, provide a charter for the corporation, and provide a plan for repayment of all or a portion of the transition year costs. How can this succeed? The Kristovich budget, which has been, which was part of the, uh, which was part of the report that was presented to you, has been the basis for our analysis as it was designed to tell the county what it needed to do to position the courses for future operation, whether the courses were retained or whether they were sold. There are four basic pieces of the puzzle that make the largest difference. One is a reallocation of the $7,000 per month per course, or $168,000, that is presently in the budget for redundant management fees. A second is that the county assumed payment of the Valkyria Airport lease which is $83,000 at this year. So golfers are not subsidizing the airport. Third is a transition from Golf Now or a renegotiation of their contract as present arrangement depreciates values of rounds that are paid by the golfers and removes an inventory of 360 rounds per month per course from that we could otherwise be able to sell. And finally, it's rather simple and perhaps easy as to include the recommendation that Mr. Kristovich had made that $2 per round be added for course maintenance and improvement, which would be an increase of $140,000. I don't find resistance to that in the golf community. Why do it this way? Why is it the preferred option? One, the sale of the three courses is a complex and most probably lengthy process due to restrictions placed on use of the lands when they were granted to the county. Second, a nonprofit entity headed by a volunteer board guarantees all revenues generated by the course are reinvested in course operations and improvements. Third, public-private partnership removes the county from operational decision making. And fourth, the county's removed from the golf course business retaining as a recreational asset its park properties and substantial investment in golf course construction. Worst case, Golf and Brevard County are unable to reach an agreement and you move to whatever else you might have voted for tonight as plan B. Our second, Golf Brevard's unable to operate on a break-even basis, falls somewhat short of that. I suppose in that case, what we would do is come back as part of your regular budget process and say, are we creating something that's worthy or worthwhile? And if there's a subsidy needed, what might that be? Thank you for your attention this evening. Thank you. Mr. Becker, just because you had said it in front of me and, and I don't forget, you had mentioned that if the county did issue a line of credit as um, you're working to get the golf courses back on, that you would be willing to pay it back at an interest rate. Yes. Okay. And. Um, in looking at in looking at the numbers with those items that I mentioned to you, then that moves us from the several hundred thousand dollar deficit to a several hundred thousand dollar positive on an operational basis, which puts us in a position to do that and put ourselves in a position where we can be looking at eventually or putting money into uh, the capital improvements that are necessary. Um, I think that in in I think we would need to have a threshold where we are working to a certain level of reserves before paying funds back. I think that's really important so that there's a safety margin there. And in all fairness, you asked for a little time to get the numbers still together. You yes. weren't as prepared as Savannah's. Miss um, Mary Ellen, you had, um, he mentioned 83,000 lease payments. What, what's the proportional amount that goes to the um, golf courses in the airport? Is, can that be a, a proportional division? 
So if we're picking an 83,000 lease payment, that's not just the golf course is correct, that's for the whole airport? That's the, uh, the, the price that the county pays to the airport. So we pay that to the airport? Yes. Is that possible to renegotiate that with the airport? Um, Let me, uh, uh, I'll jump in a little. It, when you renegotiate, the FAA is going to look for a reasonable rate of return for the youth, for the non-aeronautical use of that property. I don't know if you can get much lower than that. Um, the original agreement was some number like 42,000 or something like that. I don't know exactly, and it was a CPI over the last few years. And uh, I'll be straight out. That was a, it was a pretty good deal already. Okay. Well, if, if maybe we work forward with this and, and, you know, I'm still working through it, maybe we could get to a place where these golf courses create enough revenues that you'd be able to make those payments too and we could work that in? Again, we're, we are looking at one county entity paying another county entity and essentially the, the, um, the, the way we are looking at it at this point is that Valkyria Airport needs to, needs to be able to sustain itself without using revenue from golfers to do that. I don't think they're going to let us do it, so I think yeah. we're going to have to continue. They may. They yeah, may if I understand correctly, that's, that's because that's the FAA's land, and so we're paying a lease. That's, that's a lease that's required by the FAA and has to be of market value, and it has to go to the airport because overall... It's not the county doing because we want to. It's a requirement with the FAA for that lease. So to even with, be able to provide the land, we're going to have to make those payments regardless unless we no yeah, longer Yeah, whatever we do. We have the right to continue that lease. We do need FAA approval for any changes we make from what is currently being done. Thank you, with, sir. With due respect, the... The lease agreement itself indicates that the land has been granted to Brevard County. And uh, so my, uh, our assumption on that is that it is county, county land that is owned, but that any approval of how things are done is, through the FAA, is by the FAA. It, it, uh, Frank? It, 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 Jim or Scott? It, yeah, the land's owned by the county. Yeah. With a reverter to the right the yeah, federal government. That lease we, is a, a right. mandate, though, right? It's yeah, the lease has been, always been a requirement of FAA. Yes, right. It's that is DOT requires that if you're using the land, we have the same thing under transit for non-transit purposes. You have to get a rate of return. The Melbourne Airport would have something similar to that. Other municipal airports, if they're leasing it to private entities for other things, have to get a rate of return back. So as we're doing this private partnership concept, if we do it. Um, we, we want to get to a place where the county's not making the lease payments for the courses if we can get that profitable with them. So we can't get out of the $83,000 payment then, correct? No, ma'am. Okay. Just something to think as we go through here. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, we're going to move into public comment cards. Daniel Mackney. And Anna Cook, you'll be next if you want to come up and, and, and be ready. Oh, thank you. Okay, Doug Martin, then you'll be next if you want to come up and get ready, sir. If you state your name and address for the record, sir. Yes, uh, Daniel Mackney at 198 Driscoll Street, Northeast in Palm Bay, and I'm the District 5 representative for the Public uh, Golf Commission <laughs> Advisory Board. Um, I want to state that uh, I've worked for the federal government for the last 40 years through the military as well as currently now with the Air Force here at Patrick Air Force Base. And I understand the difficulties of trying to balance a budget and move funds to make everything happen. One of the things that occurred is we started looking in earnest at the way funds were allocated by the county, uh, Mary Ellen and their and company provided us a list of uh, what the county paid out over a 20-year period. And if you look, the county paid a flat rate over those 20 years. Now, I'd like to go back to Representative Barfield's and um, Mr. Smith's comments about CPIs. If a CPI had been provided, the county may not be in the position that it is currently in because everything went up over 20 years. 
cost of golf carts, cost of maintenance, cost of fertilizer, water, everything, right? But the county did nothing. The county maintained a stagnant rate going into these golf courses. Now, I'm not the most avid golfer as I've seen from um, the way <laughs> some of our members get very uh, invigorated when they're trying to say we need to save these golf courses. But I do have a 13-year-old son that we've been out to the habitat and one of his big complaints was, this course is really terrible, Dad. Right? And this is a 13-year-old son that's learning to play. Right? You can tell when a sand trap isn't really sand. You can tell when a golf cart path isn't really a path. Right? When you have those kind of issues from young people trying to learn to play the game, right? that's a key factor. We were just up at Myrtle Beach for the last week over the holidays, and he wanted to go out and play golf. He wanted to play golf. I was said it's way too cold, <laughs> but he wanted to play because he knows what it's like to play down here, right? I think you need to start, look, it's not just all the people that are retired playing golf, right? There are a lot of young people at schools here and people I work with that have children that golf, that want to play golf as well. And this is something you need to look forward to, is those people that are in your counties to be able to come out there and bring their children out to play golf at a place where the children recognize that it's a respectable golf course to be working, playing at. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Doug Martin and Dana Martin, you'll be next, please. Doug Martin, 3115 Savannah's Trail. This is the second home in the Savannas that my wife and I have owned and lived in for nearly 20 years. Both were purchased with the expectation that we would be living in a golf course community. The county has managed the Savannah's golf course for over 20 years. During this period, the county has never fully upheld the details of the original agreement. Hence, the course has limped along and never lived up to its potential. The course went through the devastating economic downturn in the mid-2000s, the loss of the shuttle program in 2011, and suffered considerable damage from hurricanes in the past two years, and has been without food and beverage service at the clubhouse for nearly two years. Through it all, the course has maintained a loyal group of players, and now for the first time in its history is well poised for growth. While I'll concede that over 20 years the course has not made much money, now that the stars have finally aligned in favor of the Savannas, this is not the time to pull the rug out from under the course and the residents, and here's why. KFC and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station are poised to see the most significant growth in over a decade. This includes the opening of Blue Origin, the area's first plant dedicated to building rockets. This plant is on the verge of occupancy and will bring hundreds of long-lasting, well-paying jobs to North Brevard County. Additionally, a satellite processing facility is currently under construction across the road from Blue Origin, which will bring dozens of additional well-paying permanent jobs to North Merritt Island. It is probable that additional spin-off companies in support of these two large facilities will spring up in the very near future, producing even more jobs. These are exactly the type of jobs that produce golf rounds. There are already over 400 new houses approved for North Merritt Island, and more are being planned. One of the largest developments, Egret's Landing, consisting of hundreds of homes, is well underway just two and a half miles down Hall Road from the Savannas. Further, there is an active proposal to bring approximately 200 new homes directly across the street from the entrance to the Savannas. Another multi-division, multi-dozen home development just off Courtney Parkway at Grant Road was recently approved just five miles from the Savannas. You have before you a unique public-private partnership proposal that will both solve the problems facing the commission and the county and ensure continued variety of recreational activities for county residents. The proposed partnership will put the management in the hands of a very talented group of successful businessmen and women and residents that have a vested income in seeing the course prosper. 
It is a well thought out proposal about which you have heard the details. The proposal is a win for the county by reducing the county's financial responsibility for the savannas by tens of thousands of dollars per year. A win for the homeowners who will not suffer devastating loss of property values and a win for the thousands of county residents who love the game of golf and desire to play on a first class facility on Merritt Island. I urge you to vote for acceptance of the proposed public private partnership before you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dana Martin, Bill Bancroft, you'll be next, please. If you'd move up to the front and be ready, sir. Good evening. My name is Dana Martin. I live at 3115 Savannah's Trail, Merritt Island. In reviewing the Parks and Recreation Department's homepage, I noticed that the mission statement reads, the mission of the Brevard County Parks and Recreation Department is to enhance the quality of life by providing many types and levels of service that reflect the interest and values of citizens and visitors. You might ask why the county is in the golf course business. The answer is in the mission statement for the Parks and Recreation Department. The county is and should be in the golf course business for the same reason the county is in the boat ramp business, the camp campground business, the beach business, the parks business, the nature center business, the school athletic site business, the environmentally endangered lands business, horse trails, fishing, beach, and lake swimming, and venues for water sports including sailing, windsurfing, surfing, rowing, catamaran, canoe, and kayaking, all of which are advertised on the Brevard County Parks and Recreation website, and by the way, are a great thing. The website continues to say, continues, that there are 550,000 uh, re residents in Brevard County. There are also thousands of visitors and many of the residents and visitors are interested in golf and want affordable golf county courses. In the original agreement between the county and the Savannas at Sykes Creek, the agreement states that the donated property would be developed as an 18-hole championship golf course, that the rest of the property was being developed as a planned unit development of not more than 288 residential homes, that the Savannas is <clears throat> developing and selling lots in the subdivision with the representation to purchasers of those lots that each of the purchasers will be acquiring lots in a golf course community and that do the donated parcel is to be used in perpetuity as a golf course. When my husband and I purchased our home in the Savannas, it was purchased with the clear message from this original agreement that we were buying in a golf course community with a county golf course. Every lot in the Savannas abuts the golf course. There are no disinterested parties. The final decision by the commissioners will affect the values of not only Savannah's homes, which by the way are estimated to drop about 30% in value if we have no course, but all area homes because of the real estate comps that are done. It will bring down the value of everyone's home. It will also impact those who love golf, both residents and visitors. There is so much that could be said about the past, but let us not lay blame now, but instead work together. North Merritt Island is exploding with growth, both in business and in housing, and is poised to grow even more. You have in the Savannah's Partners and the Brevard Golf Public-Private Partnerships an opportunity to benefit the Brevard County Parks and Recreation Program, reduce the financial input to the courses from the county, keep the Brevard County property values high, and benefit the homeowners. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Bancroft and John Richardson, you'll be next, sir, if you'd move to the front. Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, my name is Bill Bancroft. Uh, I live in the uh, 4195 Savannah's Trail. I'm starting my 27th year up there. I'm also a member of the Golf Advisory Board, uh, Mr. Barfield's uh, nominee, so to say. Uh, much has been said over the last 57 minutes about Brevard County's golf program and how to fix it. The last time I spoke with you, which was 
about 65 days ago, I think, before I went into two-month uh, study period. I said your golf courses are the most important county asset that we have with management challenges. I said at that time, you put someone in charge who has a sincere interest in performing their tasks, you give them the authority and the funding to do so without political influence, that done, you will find that your operation will be successful. Now, that's what you've heard today from the people that are proposing the public-private partnership. Yes, the devil is in the details. I agree with that. There's work to do. But I'm asking you today to confirm what your golf advisory board has recommended and start the process to establish the public-private partnerships at all three courses. I see this as a win-win for us all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sonia Bossinger. Oh, I'm sorry, John Richardson, Sonia Bossinger. I'm John Richardson. I live at 838 Mallard Road, Coco. And the first thing, I'd like to thank the commissioners for allowing the discussion. One of the things I haven't heard brought up or it seems to be uh, maybe misconstrued. If the commission would decide to revert the golf courses or try to sell the golf courses in the original covenants, as was mentioned earlier, the, the Savannas is to remain as a 72-hole or uh, uh, par 72, 18-hole golf course. The other thing is, before you could sell it or do anything else with it, one of the things is that the level of maintenance of the golf course, clubhouse, appurtenant structures and improvements will meet or exceed those standards established by the National Golf Foundation for courses of comparable proficiency and level of play, but will in no event be less than the highest standard maintained for any other public course in Brevard County. Now, what it seems that several of you are possibly getting hung up on the idea of the capital improvements before you can get rid of the courses, regardless of what you do, the capital improvements, the money has to be spent. And that's something that you've got to look at, is that you've got to spend that money anyway. So you might as well end up with a course that's in great shape, run by a, a bunch of people that are successful in business, and let's have a win-win for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bossinger and Jim Heath, you'll be next, sir, if you'd come to the front. Good evening, Sonia Bossinger. I'm the attorney for the Savannah's Homeowners Association. For almost 30 years, residents of the county and visitors have played hundreds of thousands of rounds of golf at the Savannas. The residents of the Savannas bought into a golf course community, which means that they paid higher prices for their homes, maintain higher property values, and in turn, pay more in real estate taxes to the county. More than half of the residents in the Savannas are over the age of 55, and many are on fixed incomes. The current annual assessment for the residents of the Savannas is $150 per home per year. If you have not been to the Savannas golf course, you may not realize it is filled with Florida trees, local species of wildlife, and some of the best sunsets our county has to offer. The golf course is located less than 10 minutes from the, the port, and it is also um, the golf course closest to the influx of jobs pouring into our county.
As we all know, the jobs coming into that portion of the county are high paying jobs. The result is an increase in home prices in the area and building of new homes and communities. In other words, more and more people are moving into the northern portion of our county, which means the pool of golfers is increasing every day just by the locals. Unfortunately, the course has not been maintained to the standards required by the agreement that donated the parcel to the county. There has been poor management from various vendors, a lack of food and bar services, and little to no marketing efforts. In addition, capital expenditures required to maintain a golf course have been left undone and caused equipment in the grounds to deteriorate faster due to the lack of maintenance. The lack of food service has been a serious deterrent of players to the course as the players cannot grab lunch or even a beer at the 19th hole after playing. We are grateful that the county has made efforts over the last three months to make improvements to the course as well as to the restaurant portion of the golf course. During the time that there was food service at the clubhouse, the residents of the Savannahs frequented the restaurant and intend to continue doing so as soon as the facilities are up again and running, which we hope to be in the next few months. Although there has been mismanagement and lack of oversight of the course, we believe there is a solution wherein the course can continue to be a great asset to the county. If the course is maintained properly with long-term goals and plans, steady capital improvements and expenditures, as well as marketing, the course can not only be self-sustaining, but also profitable. We believe the answer comes from having a team of partners who are not only vested to the venture through a capital contribution, but also live locally, and some of which love playing golf at the Savannahs. The residents of the Savannahs have gathered together and are unified in having the county not give up on the golf course business, but instead to try a new plan, a plan that involves investment by those managing the course so they can run the course like a business and make it profitable. We believe from the information we have been provided and researched that the course has the potential of being self-sustaining by year three under a public-private partnership between the county and the Savannah's partners group of investors. If the commission decided to give up on the Savannah's and revert the golf course back to the homeowners association, it would create blowback not only for the community, but also for the county. The Homeowners Association has a board of volunteers, most of who work regular jobs during the day. The idea of having an entire golf course thrown into their lap is quite daunting and also cost prohibitive among the 288 homes. Therefore, the property would likely revert to green space. The property values of each of the homes within the savannas would be reduced if the homes were no longer surrounded by a golf course. The amount paid by property taxes to the county by each home would also be reduced based on the reduction in property values. The Homeowners Association would then have to increase the assessments of each owner just to maintain the green space and water retention ponds. This large increase in assessments may cause some owners who are on fixed incomes to go into lien or even mortgage foreclosure. On the other hand, if the volunteer board of directors decided to try and maintain the land as a golf course, the assessments for each owner would increase at least 20 fold. For each owner that could not pay the increased assessment, the portion of their unpaid assessment would need to be covered by the rest of the homeowners who would have to pay then more. Again, this scenario leads to lien and mortgage foreclosures, blights in the community, and possible bankruptcy of the entire community. We are hoping the proposed solution of a public-private partnership will alleviate the Commission's frustration with the loss of monies on the golf course and create a profitable asset for the county. We also hope that the existence of the Savannahs as a public course will continue to inspire the love of golf by young people in the county and promote all of the recreational facilities that this county has to offer. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Jim Heath, Mike Hainer, you'll be next. Jim? No. Okay. Okay. Are you Mike Hainer? Yes, I am. All right, sir. I'm Mike Hainer. I live at 3490 Savannah's Trail in, in the Savannah's. Um, when we met back in October, one of the points that was made both in Mr. Christovoff's report and also some publications that the Savannah's is nothing more than a mosquito infested swamp. Um, people don't like it, it's too hard to play, too much water on it, uh, it's a difficult course. I made a point of inviting friends uh, from both the community here, uh, Orlando, 
uh, and also some out of town visitors to, to come and play our course and see what they thought of it. Didn't, didn't give them any, any uh, lead up to it. I just said, come play golf and see what you think. Um, their feedback was first, they liked the course. It was challenging. It wasn't your standard flat, wide open spaces. You had to think a little bit and you had to play it in a smart and, and technically competent manner. Uh, so the, so some of the publicity that we've seen on the course is wrong. Uh, they enjoyed the opportunity to observe the wildlife, something they don't see a lot of the places, especially the folks that were here visiting from other parts of the country. Uh, they did observe that the course appeared to be neglected, uh, but they said it's fairly consists of what they'd experienced on courses where similar rates were charged. So, so they, they didn't feel it was a real detriment, but it could, could be improved uh, from an appearance and, and playability standpoint. Uh, probably their biggest disappointment was the lack of food and beverage service. The fact that we couldn't sit down, I invited them over to my house and we sat around in the patio and had something to eat and drink. But uh, not having that ability at the golf course to, to have beverages and food was, was an, a, a setback for them. At the last uh, meeting, uh, Commissioner Tobiah uh, expressed his disappointment in the fact that at that meeting, nobody from the Savannahs really stepped up and said, we're ready to, to take charge and help out and provide some financing for this. I think the, the partnership now that, we've, that it has formed stands ready to, to make the Savannah's a success and relieve the cost burden from the county, but it will take some time. It's not something they can do overnight. It's gonna have to ramp up a little bit. So I encourage the board, the commission, to uh, vote favorably for the proposal that's been recommended by the Gulf Advisory Board. Thank you. Larry Fitzgerald. Thank you. Priscilla Dillo. And if Miss Firm would um, come forward and get ready. Thank you very much. My name is Priscilla Dillo, and I live at 536 uh, Selfridge in Melbourne, Florida. I've been a golfer at Habitat for the last 10 years. I've also played Spessard, and I've also played Savannahs. I'm a former educator, and I'm also a former director of the Indiana Golf Course Owners Association. What I know for sure, that whatever is decided for any of the courses, and particularly um, uh, the uh, Habitat course and uh, Spessard Holland, it will not be successful without major improvements and continued quality maintenance and creative management. As I, when I was director of the Golf uh, Course Owners Association in Indianapolis, they did uh, in Indiana quite a few different things uh, when they decided to revamp their course management and the city parks was uh, in charge of those courses. They went to, uh, to leases and and that is a uh, not a resort you know type. We're a seasonal uh, communities in uh, Indiana, and that was very very successful. And it was successful because they put the dollars in to improve the courses. So even the littlest course to the biggest course with lots of valleys and hills uh, in the Indianapolis proper. It was successful because they had quality courses. And when you go to a course to play. The thing that you want to see is a really, really nice maintained course with a welcoming atmosphere. And that's what has to be done. And as many of you know that, that's just the way it is. But so when someone comes here and they ask me, uh, where, where are we gonna go play golf? Well, I love the habitat because I love the wildlife. I love the, uh, the challenge of the course. But as far as condition of the course, I have to tell them before we go, it is really not in very good shape. And so, and we all know that. So that's not uh, anything new. I'm here to support the uh, golf brevard, uh, brevard uh, public private proposal. Uh, the whole thing is, uh, why not try something else? 
uh, and that can be done. And I would suggest to, the, to those people that are involved in that, that they get more input from you know, the citizens that play those courses as to, to help them decide how to uh, get uh, better uh, attendance and better uh, play at the course and, uh, and increased rounds. And there's all kinds of ways to do that because the people that really run those courses, they go to the national meetings, the National Golf Course Owners Association, and you hear from them all the inventive, all the uh, unique things they're doing to increase rounds and also to uh, make it financially uh, feasible for them to, uh, you know, to own a course, so to speak. And so uh, nationally that can be done. Then also there's a lot of things with youth that can be done to encourage that for the future. And so that would be something that, that I would hope that they would explore. And I would have to go to a, a, a quote from Margaret Mead. It says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Perhaps it is time to apply that adage to trying a public-private partnership with Brevard Golf. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Firm? Okay, um, Peter Henderson? Thank you, sir. You're Mr. Firm? Uh, yeah, Mr. Firm. Can I have um, Gail Myers come to the front, please, and be ready? Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Yes, sir, your name and address for the record? Sure. I'm Jet Firm. I live at 7250 South U.S. Highway 1. That's Grant, Florida. And I've met with uh, our Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, I'd just like to make a couple comments. The direction that's been uh, assumed by the Golf Advisory Board was almost exactly the same direction I would have taken myself with my own money. That would have been the way. The only thing I would have done was done, donated the money and taken the county off the hook. The, the structure of both proposals is superb. There's a lot of work to do yet. They're not trying not to tell you. They, they, they want to tell you that they still got some more homework. But you got to take the high road. As a real estate investment for me, there's a lot of places I can invest my money. Many of them have better returns than this. It was never about making money. It was about keeping the beautiful assets in Brevard County. That, that land was donated to be a golf course. And the board has a responsibility to keep it as a golf course. The lease with the FAA needs to be paid. That's a steal for that kind of a land. That's beautiful. There are things that can definitely be turned around. You have people that will step up and volunteer. Give them a shot. That's my, that's my only comment. Give them a shot. I had taken it myself, but unfortunately, I have to back down because there's volunteers that want to do it, and that's the best way to do it. And uh, I hope you give them the shot they deserve because they did a real good job putting it together, and I really think it's well thought out, and I am a developer, and I do know the difference. Thank you. I'm sure they'd still take your money if you... <laughs> what? I'm sure they'd still take your money if you... I'll yeah, be there if they need me. <laughs> Ms. Myers, David Bremke, you'll be next, sir. Hi, I'm Gail Myers. I live at 217 Woody Circle in Melbourne Beach. And I am an avid woman golfer, and I'm here to support women in golf. Um, I golf both at Habitat and Spresset Holland. I'm in both women's leagues there. I don't get to participate all the time because I still work, but I am a member. And I love the courses, and I please hope, and I also am a golf advisory member, too. I represent the Spresset Holland group. But I hope that you take the recommendation of our advisory group. And we really worked hard on it. And I thank Tom Becker and the rest of them all for coming up here and presenting such a great presentation for you all. And I hope you all listen to them. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Bremke and Susan Smith, you're my last card if you come forward. Good evening and Happy New Year, folks. My name is David Bremke. I am a PG, actually I live here in Melbourne, 32901, uh, zip code 3966, Mount Carmel Avenue. And I've been a PGA golf professional for 30 years. And I moved up here to Melbourne area to help take care of my parents, my a uh, aging parents. And I've been in the trenches in the golf business here in the Melbourne, Brevard County area for the last 10 years. And you know, what I say is, you know, ask why are we here? Think back a while back 
how a couple decades the golf courses were making such profits, such immense amount of profits and surpluses that so many other county programs were benefiting from the golf courses. And that was just something, a little reminder on how much the golf courses gave back. But unfortunately, at that time, the golf courses didn't have the right management to know how to put a lot of that money in a rainy day fund for what they really need now. And it's gonna go along with my theme pretty much with everything I have to say is having the proper and correct management to run your golf course facilities and <clears throat> with the city and the county facilities. As you all have heard over and over again, the reasons how uh, the golf course is gonna have a serious positive economic impact and value to the county. You've all heard that over and over again with these people, but please take some time and look in your favorite search engine for the positive economic input a green space has on a community. That alone should answer everybody's questions on why it wouldn't even be thought of to let these golf courses go. And going with the public-private uh, situation that the board is advising is a very good idea. I know that the studies have been done and the charts and graphs are presented to you folks and basically the best of my ability not to offend or upset anybody that with my experience and seeing what's been done for the last 20 years, the proper management and running of these golf courses just has never been done. And once again, no offense to the staffers and staffing that have done the marketing and advertising for the golf courses and what's in the studies, it's just no one has come to the table with the proper knowledge on how to promote your golf courses. And then also when it comes to the uh, staffing of your golf courses, it's not just reading meters or making out POs and doing uh, requisitions. It's all of these staffers are dealing with customers, human beings, day in and day out. So it's a little bit different when it comes to the human, human being aspect of customer service. Like I was saying earlier, I've been in the customer service and as a matter of fact, my motto is creating the ultimate guest experience. And if you can teach your staff that, you're only as good as your staff and I truly believe that when it comes to the customer service business, which is the golf business. And I see my time is up, but really with all the studies and everything that's done and if you take note with all the hotels that have been built and that are being built and the baby boomers retiring and the new homes and businesses that are coming here and looking up the positive impact. We're here to make Brevard County a place where people want to live and to move to. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Susan Smith. Hello. Good evening, County Commissioners. My name is Susan Smith and I live at 4072 Sandridge Drive, Merritt Island in the Savannahs. As a Savannah's homeowner, Brevard County resident and taxpayer, I am proud to live in such a dynamic community with all that is offered to the residents and tourists, such as boating, fishing, cruises, athletic sports, greyhound racing, golf, and the list goes on. In regards to the county owned golf courses, the county spent 10,500,000 to build three courses and note 4 million of that total was for the Savannahs. I don't believe it would be fair to the community or the taxpayers for the county to let go of such a valuable community asset. With the growth taking place in Brevard County through businesses such as Blue Origin, OneWeb Satellites, et cetera, and new residents coming in, this is the most beneficial time in many years to see revenues from the golf courses greatly increase. Now is the time to move beyond why and how the courses are in the shape they are physically and financially and to look forward on how they will become profitable and remain such a valuable county recreational asset. As a follow-up to the question earlier of location of the Savannahs, the location is a prime spot for both residents and tourists. It is the only golf course on Merritt Island. Um, increased development is occurring on North Merritt Island, and it is the closest golf course to tourists arriving in town via the 528 Beach Line from Orlando Airport, North I-95, North I and et cetera. As an elected commissioner, thank you for listening to the community in which you serve and for supporting the public-private partnership options for all three courses. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.
All right, that is the end of our comment cards. And uh, Commission, do you want to open up a conversation? Okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I'll start, and I'm sure I'll get some boos and some hem haws. No, you won't. Um, for me, what we I take is... We have a new civility sh- plaque back there, yeah. so... As long as people read it. Um, my hmm. issue is, first off, I don't think that all three of these golf courses belong in the same pot. We have two golf courses that have operated in the black. We've had two golf courses, along with the Savannahs, that didn't get the proper maintenance that they deserved. And I can't go back 20 years and make decisions. But I don't know anybody, and, I, I, and I've asked the question, and, and some people have, have given their what they do know of the issue versus you know what they speculate happened. I don't know of any government that builds a, a golf course, invests, as you said, $4 million into a golf course for an HOA. And what, what troubles me is, and just go into the property appraiser's website because I wanted to kind of get a roundabout. I have friends that pay $300 a month association fees with no golf course in the city of Palm Bay. And you're paying $150 a year, a year for a golf course that you're angry that it's a mosquito infested, non-maintained golf course. So perhaps, you know, Call me crazy, but I think $150 a year to live in a PUD where the county's maintaining not just the clubhouse, but the golf course is, is a little crazy to me. It's insane that, that because it primarily benefits primarily now, not to say it's not open to public golf course, but it primarily benefits the HOA. And these homes range from 250 to 350 just the five or six I looked up and not know anybody here, but just like searching um, Savannah's properties, your, your market value on your home is very good. So I don't know where the compromise is. The thing that scares me, and, and you know, maybe I know we'll come back to talk to about this, um, these partnerships. Again, I, I believe that these are separate issues. I think, you know, just speaking because obviously Savannah's is, is the big deal because Savannah's is the one where most of the people are here speaking for Savannah's and Savannah's is the one that year after year after year for the last 20 years has been losing money and whose operating expenses um, were higher than, like when you minus revenue versus expenses, were higher than Spesser Holland and who, who does 11,000 less rounds of golf a year. So I'm not sure how that, that happened, but for me, I mean, I'm okay with a public-private partnership. Anything to get this county out of this black hole of, of a debt that this this golf course seems to be. And I can't I can't be responsible, nor can I um, comment on what's been done in the past and what hasn't been done as far as maintenance goes. But I don't think number one, I don't think that we should be lumping the three together because I think the other two are profitable. And I think, again, lack of investment, that was primarily what stuck out with me the most on the Capitol, is, is not the fault of the two golf courses that actually do operate in the black. And I think for me, I think that a public-private public, partnership would be ideal if I had some sort of history of financials. We're ask, you're asking the county to take all the risk, not just financially, but to invest all this capital and take all the risk for a company that's not even been formed yet. Now, I understand the intention and the passion and, and the willingness to do it, but if, if you saw uh, Savannah's as something that's profitable and had all this promise, then I suggest that you invest your own money. But to take a gamble with the county's money, and the county's the one taking the full-on risk, I, I can't support that, at least unless somebody has a better option. And I honestly believe, in, and that's up to the Homeowners Association on what what each individual homeowner wants to invest, but $150 a year in association fees to live on a golf course that you expect the county to fully maintain, to me, is not reasonable. Thank you, Commissioner. So I started. You did well. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and jump in now. We don't have any lights on. I um, struggle with government being in in a position of competing with with the... uh, public sector out there. So I, here's my, my two thoughts, and I, I told the gentleman that I met with yesterday, is the county's got to get in the position where it doesn't lose money and that the government gets out of the golf business. We're not any good at it, and especially by your comments, I, I think that you're going to agree with that. I, I think we need to move ourselves into a position is where we, we start moving these things out of the, the, the government's 
hands of running them. My ideal, what I would like to see happen is the government, we enter into a private public partnership, government owns the land and the entities come along like a business, public pri private partnership, you guys own the business. And we'll, we'll have to work on what we need to get you moving in that to, to make it be successful. But um, this is the way I'll agree to it. We'll have to work out all the numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm working with the numbers in my head trying to, to make this work. Because if we just stop it all together right now, there's going to be a cost as there is trying to trade it out. So I'm trying to figure out what the cost benefit analysis is and what kind of funds we're looking at. So um, what I, I don't know, I guess we're going to have to do some conversations up here. But that would be my goal. And, and everybody's talking about the open green space, but let me tell you guys, it's really not a bad thing. The trend going on in the country right now is it's open green spaces with walk spaces are increasing property values. Now, if that ends up being the end thing that has to happen in, in a year or two because this doesn't work, it, it's not gonna be a bad thing. And I talked to Ms. Donner about what the cost would be is if the county maintained it as a big open park at that time. And there's cost involved with that too. So it started getting my head wrapped around if we're doing a trade out right now with taking a risk of moving into a public private partnership or paying for an open space with a park. And the analogy I got and I used was Chain of Lake Parks and I, I did a, a comparison of the amount of acres and so it's about a little bit bigger, it's about two thirds the size of it, so I did with the cost. And it, it's gonna cost, if we did an open space with a park, about 300,000 a year. So okay, there, there could be a cost on that if, if we take this risk. So a um, couple things, we inherited this. If you try to get me today to vote on the county picking up a golf course, no. I, I, I couldn't do it. I, um, I think we need to figure out a way as a county to get out of this. It's, it's a money situation and I, I possibly am gonna be um, agreeing to, to work out taking a risk. But for me to do this, I think these agreements have to move quickly. This can't be something that takes months and months to get drafted together where we're hanging out, hanging out for six more months trying to get you guys in place. Ms. Donner, how much, is it, how much are we losing every month as, as for the golf courses if we don't get this moving right now? Do you have a monthly number? So we uh, calculated that each month, the Savannahs is costing us um, $74,500. The Spessard is costing, and um, will cost about 73,000, and Habitat about 77,000. And of course that Habitat number is a little higher. Is that per because month? We're playing per month, that's because we're paying a lease. That's just cost? Yes. Okay, so it's gonna be um, an advantage for us to get moving on this so that we can get out of the losses and move it, over into the... Um, so, Chair, Madam, Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that you understood that that is just the expenses. That's not taking into account the revenues. Okay, that so offset, that's not a loss. That's just expenses. That offset, you, right, I, okay, I was answering so what, your question. what is the losses? So the, the loss is... Where is it? It's just one moment, we'll get you the exact number. You're about to have a lot of work to do out there. So we did some monthly calculations um, that included the revenue and expenses. So for example, this past December, no, this one, okay. So for Savannah's, um, it was about, now this take into account, this is uh, November. Our revenue was 40,000 and this is actuals. Our revenue was, uh, total revenue was about $48,000. Our total expenses were about $108,000. So you've got a delta of about $60,000 in the red for Savannah's, for actual numbers in November. Okay. So um, would it be fair to say with all three golf courses, we're looking at 180, is that typical? Uh, so the okay, hold on, guys. So the habitat, the the bottom line, was the habitat actually made about forty thousand dollars. Okay. And the Spessard Holland lost about fourteen thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah, we do a statistical so year. And I of course, commissioners, you have a variety please. of variables yeah, every month that 
are going to impact that. You know, we had very bad months because of the hurricane. Mm -hmm. You have right. a bad weather week. So <clears throat> I think the best number that you can look at is the estimates that were given on page nine. Thank you, county manager. What do you have? <clears throat> that would be a fiscal year golf course projection. And those numbers would show on an annualized basis on the numbers that were developed. You can see on the bottom of the page the revenue less the expenses based on what was assumed to be the rounds of golf. Um, <clears throat> there on the bottom of the page for each of the courses, 150 was the loss on an annual basis for Savannah's anticipating that one year. And Spessard Holland was at 93,000, was positive, and Habitat would be 127,000. And those obviously are based on a variety of factors. Um, including what the anticipated rounds would have been and looking at an average over a period of time. Okay, so maybe if, if we work on this, we can tighten up some numbers and, and get a, a better um, cash flow analysis that we're going to look for moving forward. So, um, I, but here's, here's going to be my criteria, and I'm going to have to hear from the rest of the commissioners, is one, this, this moves quite quickly. We get very aggressive and get this moving and, and get the transaction going. I'm going to want to see a monthly report monthly for every six months at least to make sure we're moving in the right direction. And, um, and then we'll, we'll just keep kind of taking an eye, keeping an eye on it and see if it's, it's moving correctly. And we'll have to decide on a time period to where the county's at a zero loss. And if we're not able to achieve that, or if it starts going south quickly, then we're gonna have to in there, have in there somehow that we have the ability then to the dispose of the golf courses. And, and figure out where we're going from there. But that's that's my uh, thoughts on this um, currently. Commissioner Tobias, or Commissioner Azari, you first? Or? No, I was asking before. Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Madam Chair. And you've brought up uh, a number of good issues. And uh, I, I, I want to thank, uh, f first of all, I think we should handle this, as mentioned before, separately. Um, the Savannah's partnership, I. Uh, want to thank them we set a deadline of 60 days and they worked in conjunction with staff and the attorney's office to put together some uh, hard numbers uh, I know they went around and uh, met with uh, various commissioners and uh, uh, Mr. Shea was uh, in my office and uh, though we disagreed on much of the philosophy it was uh, quite an honor to have him there someone with uh, a great deal of uh, uh, success in business and it's also uh, wonderful to have someone step up and want to participate in, um, in in government and what did come out of that I think and there were some changes since since we spoke um, but it was a very uh, uh, a very positive outcome because though we may again disagree on the philosophy <laughs> we came to an understanding of the numbers and this is the, this is the uh, duty of the commission. We have to make a determination based on the numbers whether or not it it, we should allocate those resources um, to the golf business. So sitting with, um, and, and many of these same numbers were presented up there. I did a pretty uh, clear chart. I think I passed out here and would be more than willing to uh, pass out uh, anyone as we move forward. The, f the first one is, is the, uh, the status quo. What, what are we doing now? Uh, we have to look at uh, uh, the operating loss. We have to look at capital expenses. These are things that deferred maintenance that we've put off. So you may hear that they make a tiny profit, but there's a ticking time bomb out there of things that are going to break and cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you heard Mr. Shea mention one uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $400,000 for just the, the, the roof deck. Not only are there are structural capital expenditures, there are course capital expenditures that Mr. Kristovich outlined uh, of uh, more than $550,000. Even if we were divest of this course or uh, exercise or revision, we still have debt to pay. The, this course 
um, was taken out on a loan in 1988 for $3.65 million, which we have not satisfied. Uh, we owe approximately $819,000 right now to solid waste. Um, in addition, there are water management fees, whether or not we were to uh, continue this as a golf course or continue this as a green space. That would be a responsibility of the county. So what I've done is aggregate these numbers um, and uh, provi provided annotations for each and every one that, that, that uh, this was very fluid and there were some major changes that as soon as I got, I, I shared with uh, Mr. Shea and they're now reflected in this. But, you know, for the, for the benefit of the commission, the status quo I looked at over the next three years, if we were to continue with this management and cover the capital uh, expenses, it would be roughly three and a half million dollars. Um, and there are ongoing capital expenses that we have no idea what those could be. That is uh, 1.2 million dollars that, um, that the county uh, identified, $559,000 that Mr. Kristovich identified, uh, operating losses that have been outlined in the Kristovich study, uh, the debt to solid waste and the water management. So it's 3.5, closer to $3.6 million. So then we step in with the public-private partnership. Would they do better than the, the status quo? And uh, the answer is yes. Actually quite a bit better, to the tune of about a million and a half dollars. So I, I, I want to say uh, congrats uh, for the, to the hard work and uh, you've, you've, you've walled government. Uh, you, you've proven that you can build a better mousetrap. Not only that, through the discussions that we've had and what you put up here, you've taken quite a bit of the risk. Uh, my understanding was that you were willing to place caps on this. So to say that um, if we provide X amount of dollars, any overages will be covered by the partnership. And that mitigates our risk. And I think that is absolutely wonderful. When we aggregate those, um, the numbers that I got from the meeting with the changes that we got to, to, to uh, to be honest, were uh, 180 and oper 180,000 in operating loss. This is over the next three years. I took a three-year approach. Uh, $900,000 again capped. We identified 1.28 million. You said you could do it for 900,000. I don't doubt that private enterprise can do it less than government. Uh, the course expenses. Um, you said $200,000 again. Uh, more than half. Uh, off of what the capital expenses are. I have no reason to doubt uh, you with your resolve and your education and your caring. It's absolutely incredible. But, uh, and on top of that, um, the, the cost of the county would be the 800,000, 819 for the solid waste and the 32 for the water management. Putting our uh, uh, public private partnership at uh, $2.1 million. So again, you beat the 3.6 by 1.5 million, so you're at 2.1 million dollars. Uh, congratulations, much better than I could have um, ever done. However, there is another plan out there, and this is the decision that the board must determine. We have many needs out there. I've knocked on a lot of doors and asked people what is their number one concern or what are their top concerns with county government. I heard a lot about the Indian River Lagoon. I heard a lot about our broken infrastructure. I didn't hear any about golf, and two of the three golf courses are in County Commission District 3. If we were to uh, exercise the reversion clause, the plan would cost the county $851,000. That is, again, the $32,000 for the water mitigation that we ha would have to pay over the next three years in, in perpetuity, it's my understanding, as well as the $819,000 to pay off the debt on this golf course. So we have to make a determination. Is it worth operating the Savannah's golf course, which will cost us best case scenario. This is the best case scenario. Mr. Kristovich can speak to the golf is declining at an exponential rate, but I, I, I believe that this group is going to work hard and do uh, to the best of their ability, but even the best of their ability is going to be almost $2.1 million. Now, it was brought up 
This was all news to me, the contract there about leaving to, to, to a certain standard, and uh, a very good point. I read the contract, and it seemed <laughs> decently clear to me, but one thing I've learned is um, I'm just a teacher, I am not an attorney. So thankfully the county has uh, an attorney, in fact a whole team of attorneys that looked over the contract, and I believe uh, Mr. Knox can speak to that, but as you can see, um, I've put zero because the response that we got back, or that my office got back, is that we would not be on the hook for bringing it up to that standard for a whole uh, litany of reasons. Again, I'm not an attorney, so I'm gonna let the attorney speak to that. But the question ultimately comes, and this is what uh, um, um, Chairman Chairwoman Pritchett mentioned, is it worth it? So the question is, is it worth it, best case scenario, to operate the Savannah's golf course at an operating loss of $1.2 million more than uh, the reversion? If this was a break even where the county would have been on the hook for the exact same, if there was a possibility to make money, uh, that would be different. But the best case scenario is this will cost taxpayers one point. And these, again, are not my numbers. These are the numbers that Mr. Shea provided me with that would be reflected in the contract as well as what would be if we were to uh, uh, exercise uh, with this uh, exercise the reversion. So again, um, I'm going to hold off a little bit when it comes to uh, the Golf Brevard because though we gave a 60-day uh, time limit and uh, again, thank you so much for um, the Savannah's uh, st the public-private partnership coming forward, y y you, you outlined it. You put numbers to this and, and again, you did a wonderful job. You beat government handily. Um, uh, Golf Brevard is in the infancy, and there's many holes in that cheese. Uh, but uh, I, I hope that uh, we can at least agree on these numbers. Um, they're out here, they're annotated, and then we can make a determination as a board whether or not it is worth uh, going forward at this cost. And I'll be very honest, while I respect and greatly admire the people that step forward, I greatly admire the people that step forward. I don't think the $1.2 million uh, to fund the Savannah's Golf Course, best case scenarios to fund the Savannah's Golf Course, is worth the potentially uh, 10 or 12 miles of roads that uh, Brevard County can repave of the hundreds of backed up miles that, that we're behind that the bulk of Brevard County citizens uh, use, as opposed to while there are a lot of golfers uh, who, who use the Savannah's Golf Club or golf course, it, it pales in comparison to the people that drive our deteriorating, deteriorating roads. So again, I can't say this enough. Uh, thank you so much for coming forward, but um, I, I, and, and congratulations for doing so much better than we're doing, uh, but I just can't, uh, with a good conscience, vote for the, uh, the extra expense of $1.2 million. Are you through? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, this commission gets hit with a lot of different things, and, but it seems like a lot of the issues began 20 and 30 years ago, and yet we get blamed for it, you know? Um, but we've infrastructure issues, as Commissioner Tobias said, we, and we have these golf courses that, that have been around for many, many years. Uh, along with that, though, we pick up a lot of the, the issues of, of why we can't revert it simply or we can't sell them. And uh, I know we, our attorney uh, office gave us a good opinion on what would have to happen to revert to Savannah's golf course. But I want to mention one uh, about um, Spessard Holland first. I, uh, good or bad, I work a lot in federal contracts, and I understand what it takes to revert property from the U.S. government. And I'll tell you what, uh, it doesn't happen very easily at all. And uh, I see some of y'all that work in the federal government understand what I'm saying. And Bureau of Land Management is the slowest of anyone, and they have a complete process you have to go through to even revert that land. Um, and they have to initiate it, and they don't usually take input from the public to do that. 
And if you want, if they are going to want to sell that, they have to put it out for bids, um, whoever pays the highest. So I, I, realistically, the item that we talked about for, for Spessart Holland to um, buy that land or from the federal government, I, it would, probably wouldn't happen in my lifetime. It wouldn't happen in my grandkids' lifetime. Yeah. Just to tell you the truth, that's that's how it is. So I think that that's one issue there that it really would not work. The other thing is this on Savannah's. Now Savannah's, I'm going to ask the attorney here to give us a, a Mr. Knox to give us a discussion on what it takes to revert this, um, and all that goes along with that, and explain what reversion is exactly to, please. You're talking about the reverter, or are you talking about trying to? The reverter for Savannah's. Savannah's. Okay. Well, the, the contract provides that if the county stops uh, using it as a golf course, that it is abandoned and is consequently it automatically reverts to the, in this case, the homeowners association since they're now the uh, successor. Sorry. In, if the county stops using the golf course as a golf course, the property reverts to the homeowners association who are the accessors, the successors to the uh, original reversion that was in the contract. Uh, that's pretty much what it is. If you decide as a group that that's what you want to do, that's what happens. Okay, so what are some of the other issues here, uh, you know, um, with individuals who bought this property, bought it, with understanding that a golf course, um, what are their rights? I mean, uh, what I'm getting to is this: Could there be a potential lawsuit? Well, there'll be a lawsuit. I'm, I'm, I have no doubt that somebody will probably just try okay. to sue. And what would you know? We have and, no idea what that would take. How long? It, well, that would take time, and it also would be uncertain as what the result would be. So, so what you're saying is, like Mr. Tobias' thing uh, with the reversion. Yeah, that's it. In a perfect world where it all works. But we could end up having to do the status quo for two or three more years. And I, I put the price, I mean, that's a high because it's probably going to be less than that, but it's 3.3 million right there. So multiply that times two or three, and that's what we're paying. Uh, because we, that's an unknown. If we, if we end up, we would revert this, it's going to go to court. It could be a long, long time. It could be who knows how the court system works. Meanwhile, we're continuing to be the status quo. We're having to pay and pay and pay. Um, and any way you look at this, any way you look at this, we're going to have to pay something. And uh, so I don't, think, I don't think the reversion is the opportunity to do that. I don't see how. It makes no sense because we're still going to be paying. So I'll open up and let some other people talk first, and I'll come back to it. Mr. Knox, you mentioned abandonment as opposed to reversion. No, the, the failure to use the property as a golf course would be const, would constitute abandonment, which would cause the reversion to the. Okay, so if we walked away from it, we don't have to. We would not incur your two or three years of expenses that you're mentioning, Mr. Barfield. We would we would walk away from it, and that would be it. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well, you know, yes, that, that, that could happen, but, you know, it, it's kind of interesting to, to tell the residents, okay, the county's been operating this golf course for 20-something years. We bought our house in the agreement that we we're going to do that, um, and now the county's going to abandon, abandon the golf course, and you, you've got it now. It's on you. Let me tell you, Royal Oak did that. Royal Oak was private. They abandoned, and they tried to sue them. Well, they filed bankruptcy. Uh, we can't file bankruptcy. So any way you look at it, we're going to be sued. So, I mean, if, if we try to revert this or abandon it, absolutely. I, well, I, and, I can, and I can understand what you're saying, but, you know, I'm looking at numbers here, just, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be cruel. I'm just looking at facts. Um, these folks pay a total of $150 a year for their homeowners association. So that's... I, don't have a computer here. My brain doesn't work that fast, but uh, okay, seventeen thousand two forty. How many years of attorneys can they hire for that? How long is it going to last? 
I don't know, but I'm just saying. You yeah. know, I, I know that. Well, they, let's they, let's they, now talk about. And the, I'm not. And I'm not suggesting that we. We. I, I'm just saying that you, you look at the hard numbers. Um, the hard numbers are that we lose a lot of money there, and so what do we do to solve that problem? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw another one out if you don't mind. I'm going to go ahead and talk. Um, 288 homes, let's say, at $4,000 is their taxes. That's $1.152 million a year in property tax. Uh, you reduce that by by 20 or 30 percent. You're talking at you know another $330,000. We're losing in tax money just on those houses alone. Okay. Well, then let me let me suggest Every this. Year. It, I, I disagree just simply because I'm sure most, if not all, these houses are homesteaded. So because they're homesteaded, it's not going to affect the, the amount of money the county takes in at all. Very possible. But you also have uh, bankruptcies or whatever. You know, do we want to take that risk by abandoning a golf course and leaving that? Listen, I, I wish we didn't have all this in the first place, but we've got it. We've been dealt with it, and we have responsibility to the citizens in, that, in the community. Now, the best way to get out of this is to take the opportunity with the partnership, see what they can do. We still have some more negotiation to do. I, I think both of them, actually. But you know what? They are putting money up in themsel for themselves, and they are also uh, putting themselves out there on it. So my, my belief is this, that we give them a shot, because first off, we're going to be paying for this up until October anyway. Why don't we at least try that? Okay, let me let me again be devil's advocate here. Um, you say they're putting up money on their own, mm -hmm. which totals ten thousand dollars. One hundred fifty thousand dollars. Where's the one hundred fifty thousand from the partners? That's the partners. That's not the homeowners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The homeowners are putting in ten thousand. So that's about thirty. people. So that's about thirty bucks a year that they're kicking in. I don't so know if they... if they're so worried about, and I'm, again, I'm being devil's advocate here, mm -hmm. if they're so worried about the loss of their values, I would think mm -hmm. that they'd be much more willing to come up with the money to help these uh, folks, these guys, the, the, the Fred Shea and, and the, the, the partnership. And so I'm thinking if, I'm just doing some quick numbers here. 288 homes, um, if they contributed $416 a year, in addition to their 150, that's only $34 roughly a month to maintain the value of their homes. If their home value is based on being next to a golf course, if they kicked in $34 a month, I don't think that's an outrageous amount of money. And that would raise $120,000 to go toward the partnership. So that may be a way to get where you want to go. Just. Okay, I don't, anybody Throwing from the Homeowner Association want to speak to this? or? Let's, um, okay. Let me let Commissioner okay. Znardi go first, though. Commissioner Znardi? I have a question for Mr. Knox. Um, do you, I mean, I know it's a big prediction, and I'm sure that, you know, everybody wants to protect their home values, but nobody wants to pay for the golf course that lives there. Do you project, if we're sued, that the county can somehow be successful and either abandoning or reverting back the golf course to the homeowners association. I mean, are we? Do you believe that we would be successful in defending that? I believe two things. I believe that you have an eternal obligation to maintain a golf course, which I don't think is a legal provision to begin with. And I do believe that somebody will try to make a claim that you should pay for all the reduction in value or you should pay for the re reinstatement of the condition of the golf course to something that should be, uh, that the contract provided for, even though it's been 20 years and apparently it's never been done that way. Um, but I think the contract provides its own remedy, which is if you ba abandon the golf course, it reverts to the, the person who holds the assignment, to, uh, to the, which is the, in this case is the homeowners association. And I think even if the contract were valid, it would be, uh, that's your remedy. Yeah, and I'm sure they'll claim we breached the contract because we never maintained it to the standard that it was supposed to be maintained to. But again, that's another issue that. But then you could show the losses over the last 20 years. To yeah, well, well, there's a lot of things we can show. But, right. but, but the, the main thing is that nobody's ever come to us and complained about it either that I know of. Thanks. So. I hate us getting into a position to where we're even talking about homeowners having to sue or us sue. 
if there's if there's a way we can maybe take a period of time and, and possibly make this work. If if we do go down this this route, I think um, Commissioner Barfield, we should put in there contractually that if we give it a period of time and it's not working, that it will revert back to the homeowners, and then maybe there can be a um, something in there that there's not going to be any lawsuits filed, and it's going to everybody be. Hey, y'all, please don't please don't speak out right now, okay? We're we're just having some conversations, trying to make some ideas. Um, and it, but if you know if if that's not even going to be part of it here, you know, it, it might be easier just to bite it now. You know, we're we're working real hard of trying to get something that that's a bit of a win-win for everybody. Everybody's not going to be ecstatically happy with this either way. There just is no way that I'm going to even agree to it for the county to keep losing a million dollars a year on a golf course. We've got to do something different. And if we can make this business-wise work with some business smarts and, and it has an ability to do it, I possibly could have been in agreement to, to giving this a shot. We're gonna have to really work on some contract numbers and some time periods and some um, ideas of what we're gonna do at the end of it if it works or doesn't work. Again, my goals are that the county loses no more money in golf courses and that the county is no longer in the golf business, that we hold the land and you own the business. So if the business doesn't work, then it's your business that fails and not the county business that we have to come up and do something with it. You own the buildings and everything. It's just a complete transfer at that time with this public-private partnership. So um, Commissioner um, Isnardi. Yeah, I mean, my concern is, and, and I'm, I'm all for reverting back, because I do think the private sector can do it better than government in many ways, especially when it comes to running a golf course. However, just like integrity and just like Mr. Barfield was up here saying before, who does the background on all this stuff? I mean, everybody says that we, um, we're all in and we're all excited and we're all gonna invest, but I mean, what assurances does the county have? If we're making the investment and we're paying them to operate and we're paying and we're investing all this money in capital, we're still the ones ultimately taking the risk. So again, I, 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 again, I caution, that these are separate issues in my opinion. We have, you know, two different issues here. We have the Savannas, which is a whole separate issue because it's a whole separate situation. And we have Sylvester and Holland and Habitat. But I would just caution, as much as I am excited about the public-private pri partnership, I mean, what kind of financials can this commission expect to see? I mean, if this commission's even gonna consider going that route, I mean, we have to have some financial protections. Otherwise, we're just throwing more money at a bad idea, you know, and I, I don't want that to happen. Uh, well, first off, we've got a lot, we have to work out a negotiated agreement. This is all in concept right now. There's a lot more to be done with that, and all this can be nailed down. Details and performance and all of that. Um, I mean, you have to understand, we've only been working on this at a little over 60 days, so, I mean, there's a lot more that goes into this. Uh, but we'd like to have the Homeowners Association uh, speak. That's okay. Yes, yes, the attorney. yes the attorney for Sonia Bossinger for the Savannas at Sykes Creek. There keeps this notions going around that the assessments for the Savannas is only $150 per year. I represent 450 homeowners associations throughout Central Florida, and homeowners association boards can only create a budget to pay for those items that the association is responsible for. They can't create an arbitrary budget just to increase the assessments. They need to have those items that they need to pay for to be part of that budget. So the Savannah's has been able to keep their budget low because of the fact that they only have certain expenses that they have been responsible for. They have not at all said that their only contribution is the $10,000. The $10,000 is the injectment they are doing from the get-go to become one of the partners to have a seat at the table. From there, we have discussed with Mr. Shea's group actually having a tiered membership among the homeowners association where the members who will be using the golf course facilities, which does not include every member of the homeowners association, having a tiered type of membership for more equity injectment where they are paying monthly to have a discount on rounds of golf, a discount at the restaurant if they don't play golf. Maybe they want to come in and just have 
have a cocktail and have some sort of discount program or have that ability to be part of the clubhouse and have that feeling of community. But the association is willing to put forth the money. We just need the county to take that chance. We understand it's, it's a big investment. There's been major losses by the county, but we feel that this is an avenue where the county can actually have management of people who care about this facility. A lot of them live within the Savannas and they can actually take care of this asset and make it a profitable one for the county. I think Mr. Shea's proposal shows that this golf course can be self-sustaining where the county's equity injectment becomes less and less month by month. I know that he's seeking $70,000 from the county each month for that to defray their expenses, but once they've passed that threshold, my understanding is they're planning to put that money back to the county. So if they and only need in, in capital well. investments, correct. No, 70, it was 70000 a month plus the capital investment to bring it up to par. Correct. Which is something that we probably won't be doing for the other courses if we agreed to this. But the other courses have an $83,000 lease per month, too. So right. there, there's a give and take but with their, all of those But their situations. revenue is much larger, so we can, we can go back and forth. Right. But I of course. think the question for you was about the um, investment of the homeowners association. So that's still negotiable. So Absolutely. We're working through this. We could actually write this up a contingent upon the homeowners willing to make X amount of dollar investment towards this also. Right, and we have the support of the community. We had a large town hall meeting, it was actually televised on Space Coast Daily, where the, the almost the entire community was represented. Maybe they, if they couldn't make it, their neighbors came, but we have a lot of support from this community of people that are willing to pay the money to protect their property values. We just want to be able to work out that negotiation and have the county take the chance so that that negotiation can take place. Okay, Mr. Knox, did you have your light on? Did you wanna? <clears throat> I think the negotiation sounds like where I would make my comment, but we, you know, the county has other mechanisms for collecting money from property owners as well. So, I mean, it's something we could talk about with them okay. if we get to that point. I, I think what I'd like to ask the commission is, is if we're going to um, work towards maybe um, kicking out some some contract ideas with public private private partnerships. If so, I'm going to recommend we we go to a, a workshop next week and start discussing or if we're just gonna go ahead and um, move with um, Commissioner Tobias' idea. So I, I kinda would like to know the consensus of where you guys wanna go right now so we can figure out where we're gonna um, maybe benchmark from here and, and start um, working on other ideas if, if we're gonna continue with this idea. Cause I think it's starting to get a little late and I think we need to come in and, and sit down with the commission, bring numbers if we do this of what we're willing to do as a risk for the county on, on the taxpayers and what we think that will um, work out with the entities that we're gonna negotiate with. Commissioner Barfield. I know, uh, well, I hate to do this, but I think we, I think we probably need another 60 days, both for, for both of them. And that gives us time for negotiate, to work some negotiation, get the homeowners association work through that, um, work with, with uh, legal here to go ahead and make sure we have a, a good agreement that we can bring forward to look at. Um, I, I really think that's where we need to go. I, I think we need to do another 60 days. Um, if it possible, we could even at some point when we get some of this negotiated, um, let the attorney's office go ahead and go ahead and funnel it to the commissioners so they already know ahead where we are. Okay, maybe um, if we sit down with a real strong formal one, but if we do one earlier than that, I, I think this is gonna take more than one good meeting. Yeah. So what if we, we come back in and do a workshop in a month and we get our ideas together, okay. and then we see if that's even gonna be agreeable, and then we, we really start trying to have it worked out in we, 60 we days may, or so. If we have enough out where you can look at it, we, we can maybe uh, not even have to do the workshop. We, we're close enough, but. I like the idea of having the workshop available. Yeah, I just I think it's going to take a lot of conversations, and, and that way we can openly talk with the uh, people coming up trying to represent. Commissioner Isnardi. I would just, before we go through the work and the trouble, we probably need to get a consensus of the board. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's what I'm looking to do. Does anybody want to make a motion of direction right now, and um, so we know what we're going to be doing? Okay, I make a motion that we. Uh, uh, extend the 60 days where we can do some individual negotiation. I say individual, the two different organizations. We can negotiate, we can work towards getting uh, a, a good agreement that we can bring forward to the county commission to approve. 
would you agree to throw in that 30-day workshop in between for us to have a conversation as we're doing that? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Thank you, sir. I have a motion on the table. Do workshop. I have a second. second? I have a second by Commissioner Smith. I just want to have a quick yes, comment. Yes, ma'am. I mean, I, I would support this, but I, I guess keep in mind, and, and maybe, you know, obviously I'm one vote, and I, and I feel pretty strongly that we shouldn't be continuing to throw good money at, at, a, at a failing course, but any which way around it, any public partnership, whether it be Savannah's or whether it be the other courses, if we're gonna go that route, then, then the next step needs to be us moving out of the business. It's sure not does. something I wanna continue on forever. I don't want us to continue to have to support it if, if, if we're gonna go the private route. It's that, I mean, I, I personally, you know, and I'm sorry to say it because all you people live in the Savannah's, but I personally would get get out of the whole Savannah's disaster because I, I don't believe, as much as I, I feel for you guys, I don't believe that without a huge influx of money uh, of your own, it's not going to even break even, you know, and that's just my opinion. I guess I'm going off the last 20 years and, and the last discussions and talking with old commissioners that have dealt with the same issue. Um, because the industry doesn't call for it. The golfing's down and it's not probably gonna go up. So if you look at the trend of, of across the country. So anyway, I mean, that would be the only way that I would continue to even consider supporting that is if this commission would agree, at least by a majority, that if we anything partnership wise that we eventually move out. Agree totally with that. Commissioner Tobaya. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be more brief this time. Uh, we have an expert in the uh, audience, and I know he probably doesn't want to come up here, but his name's been mentioned a lot, and I don't want to move forward with something that there's zero potential of happening. Mr. And Krisovich. Mr. Krisovich. So I think it's probably our, 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 you know, if you could come up here and lend your expertise. We read your report. All of us read your report. Is there a way, is there a way to, you, you've heard some things that we, want to break even, uh, that we want to own the land, was it? Um, well, if you do a public-private partnership and we have to maintain the land, but we don't own the business. So it's like we have it, they give us a dollar a year to to rent it or lease it, and it's their business. And we're not responsible for nothing, any of the capital. Nothing. And we're not going to come up with. They own the buildings and everything. That's okay. what I want to get to. Can we, is that, a, with the trends that you've outlined, is that a possibility? Is it worth us? punting again for 60 days for uh, that as a, po or what are the odds of that actually happening? Um, well, good evening, everybody. And <laughs> sorry, <laughs> thanks for not using my name in vain, at least. Um, <clears throat> I guess I would tell you, you got a couple things going for you. You're in positive cash flow season right now. So if we're in business and we're talking about going another 60 days, you don't have to worry about being upside down as far as the revenue numbers are concerned. You've sold a little more than $100,000 in annual passes and discount cards, so that's giving you a little bit of a cushion. And it's the busiest quarter of the year, notwithstanding that we had a tough start to January. What I can tell you is that the um, trends are not any different than they were three months ago, nationally, regionally, or locally, and at these golf courses. October was kind of an anomaly because of the storms, although we did have a hurricane last year that interrupted our business for a week to 10 days. November uh, in the main was uh, decent weather. We did have some wet conditions at the habitat, but our, our rounds were, were still down in November by like 30% to prior year. Um, we got into December and obviously the numbers are just in, but our rounds and revenue in December year over year in the aggregate uh, was 13%. So we're still sliding, right? So the numbers kind of don't lie. The trend lines are still showing decline in rounds and, and revenue at our three courses in the Florida market, regionally and nationally, we're still losing golfers. So are the things that could be done better at the golf courses? Certainly, and they have been. Uh, the golf courses are in pretty good shape. Now the greens are very good at all three. And we've looked at the competition and the courses are positioned appropriately price-wise and conditions-wise. So you think about that and you say, okay, we're we're doing a good job now. We're greeting the guests. We're making sure that they get a clean cart. We're wearing name badges, all that kind of thing to make the experience as good as we can make it. And yet we're still down 13% in December, which is one of the better months of the year. So 
that's the difficulty that I'm having. Now, is it worth trying something different to see if these guys can put it together? Uh, realistically, it's a good time of year to be doing that because you're not writing checks to make payroll. I think you're on the right track with making it a short timeline to investigate that. And I'm happy to help the county as part of my scope to dig in a little bit on the numbers and, and what their business plans are. I've had some discussions with both groups. They've asked me for you know, some data. Um, happy to help if I can. But those are the numbers where we are. That's kind of uh, what the data tells us. But you're, if there was a time of year to be doing this, now would be the time because we'll be making hay. And But once you get to May, June, sun summer comes and it starts raining and we get back to you know all that right okay you. you're welcome mr tobias did you have more questions for him uh no i didn't it's it sounds like if we're going to do this, this is a good time i don't know if that was a one in a million or one in ten thousand or one in 20 i didn't press him on that but uh if we do go this do go this route I would uh, ask uh, and I don't know that I could vote for it but I would ask for th this you know the, the plans are even best case scenario going to cost a million bucks so my question is if, if we're going to go this route I'd like to identify where this million dollars is going to come from I think that um, I, I think that that's only fair the golf uh, trust as we move forward for three years into this best case scenario um, let's identify where that's going to come from what we're going to have to cut in order to fund this golf course well, can um, I, oh. I would ask secondly that um you know Co commissioner barfield is really bright and he said on 713 that we need to learn from this and not let it happen again he said this is a situation where we should have a performance bond and uh, uh, uh chairman smith said that was an excellent idea i want to agree on that and be third so i i would like to ask and I had this discussion with Mr. Shea that we protect ourselves that way. And I, I, I want to thank uh, um, Commissioner Barfield for making that out. And uh, if we can identify that $1.3 million or the one point whatever million dollars that this is going to, um, uh, I, I'd like to come up with a way where there's no liability and there's no cost on, on, on the county for the foreseeable future. And one final thing. Uh, that I would like to see the, uh, right now it is my understanding that there's uh, plans uh, for about 70 or 80 70 some thousand dollars of county funds that are going uh, into this uh, golf course for the snack bar um, since we haven't made the decision yet as to whether enter into that public private partnership or the reversion I would ask that we withhold that $70,000 because if we do the reversion, then we're putting county resources into what will eventually be an HOA asset and uh, is probably not the wisest use of uh, county dollars. So if we do go forward, I would ask for at a minimum uh, those four conditions to be met or at least uh, examined as we move forward. Okay, well, it sounds like I know we haven't voted through, but we're probably going to start working on some kind of a, a contract. Contract. So I really think it's going to be a good idea for us to start getting these types of ideas to together, Commissioner Tobias and, and everybody, with, with what we want to see in it. And I think it's going to have to be sooner than 60 days that we can at least sit down and come to the table of what we're looking for. And I know... Um, you're not going to be ready with your numbers for about 60 days, but at least we can start working on whether we're going to be able to come to the table with something that's going to work. Just want to remind you, according to the presentation on page nine, we'll still be positive all the way up to the end of this fiscal year. We sure will. So we do have time. I mean, we have some time to, to deal with this. Um, so I, I'd much rather make sure we get this and get it right uh, and uh, quite frankly, what everyone's saying here, and I think everybody in this audience knows it, if this doesn't work, that's probably going to be it. I mean, that's, that's it. So this is that shot that we need to do. And if we can't, if we can't make it on this, if it doesn't go, then, you know, it could be no savannas, you know, so that's, that's what we need to understand. That's how serious this is. So. I think we're good if we just move forward right now. We are, again, positive 
through the end of this year, correct? So I think at that point, and I think we need to work out this negotiation, we'll work out a, 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 how we can do this, a little bit much more detail. And I'm fine with, um, if we want to do a workshop on this too, but also I think we need to have communication uh, out that we all see what's going on. This is a, this is a major asset. It is uh, something that we didn't bring on ourselves as a commission, but we have to deal with this. Every other commission has tried to, and they haven't been successful at it. And I only have 320 days left, so I want to make sure that we can get a solution that's going to be viable for the future. So, uh, so anyway, I, I, so I have a motion on the floor. It's seconded, so I think that's where we go. Okay, I'm, I'm going to um, call the motion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Nay. Oh, it passes three-two with commissioners Tobia and Isnardi in opposition. Okay, and I guess we'll, we'll set up some time. Um, Mr. Bo um, Mr. Body, I'm sorry, go ahead. If I could, uh, just two points. One, <clears throat> excuse me, to talk about the board schedule, yeah, we have um, scheduled currently a workshop date on, um, f well, the January, f we have one for January 18th, but that's only a week away. And, Do you guys um, want to come I and at least talk little... about contract terms for us? A little early. On, um, but at least to give the suggestion that I would give is if 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 the January 18th date is too early, if we want to try to get back in 60 days, a second option would be we're currently scheduled for uh, a budget and uh, workshop and homestead exemption on February 15th. Um, if the board wanted to move that one to to March, we could have it. Um, this workshop on February 15th, that would give us 30 days, the board 30 days, and then we would be able to get to the 60-day period. Not that I'm trying to move that budget workshop away, I'm trying to give the board um, a time that uh, we could get that done in a timely manner, accomplish what the board's trying to do, address the issue, okay. and so we could get back in 60 days. If that's in the board's interest, and then I will have staff do that. Okay, and sir, then, maybe we can work offline too. If we have time, we can come together before another month for the budget one also. Sure, and then my last item would be, um, during the 60-day negotiation period, we put it in the PowerPoint, does the board want to appoint someone to be working um, and, you know, in, in past instances, the board has done that, has selected someone from the board to participate in, in working with either of the two groups or both groups. I don't know if that's up to the board uh, to make that decision in terms of uh, moving forward with uh, preliminary negotiations. I just look for the board direction on that if there is any. Thank you, sir. Okay, so um, I believe we're gonna come back and, and we're gonna have a workshop and we'll be in touch with all of you and um, we'll, we'll start getting some ideas together and running them off of you and see what we can get that will work and hopefully come up with a solution that'll take care of everybody. I think um, the worst thing that we could do is just abandon it and drop it on you. And that's just not gonna be the thing I'm gonna wanna do ever. So we've gotta come up with something. Again, every, nobody's gonna be really like happy, yay, we got it. It's just there's, there's not gonna be that solution, but there should be something here, I'm hoping, that everybody ends out in a good place by the time we're done and that the county's not losing any more funds. Uh, thank you for coming out. I really appreciate, we all appreciate your input and we appreciate your kindness tonight and uh, we're gonna be working hard for you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna. We still have more business. <laughs> we're done. We're done with golf. If y'all would mind, um, go ahead and have conversations outside. We have to continue meeting with a couple more things here. <clears throat> I believe we're at um, new business. 
number six now, and County Commission, we have to actually um, close out our session right now. We have to change to the Barefoot Bay Council, and I need a motion to do that. Can I get a motion from someone? I'll make a, I'll make a motion to, uh, to switch to the Barefoot Bay Council. I have a motion by Commissioner Isnardi. Can I have a second, please? Second, second by Commissioner Barfield. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. We are now the Barefoot Bay Council, and I think this is Mr. Knox. Is this you? Item 6F1. 6F. Yeah, these are uh, bonds that are being issued, or at least they're hopefully going to get approval to be issued for the financing of Barefoot Bay improvements. Uh, I believe, let's see what the amount was here, $1.3 million and twice. So th that's what we're looking for. Approval of the resolutions. Okay, so this um, it seems pretty simple, but I think all these lights are old. Do I have a motion to, um, to move forward with this? I make a motion that we... Um, request the board accept the proposal of TD Bank and A to provide the Barefoot Bay Water and Sewer District with a term loan to uh, refund all of its outstanding utility revenue bonds, Series 2000. That was perfect. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. All in favor, vote aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. Motion by Commissioner Barfield, second by Commissioner Tobaya. Item 2, County Attorney. I'm gonna, this is actually uh, Mr. <laughs> Helmer's oh, item. Oh, sorry. I, I gave one of them, one of my items to them earlier, so they're trying to reciprocate, I think. So. He did the speaking Helmer. in the briefing, so I just figured. Well, this was actually really good news because we get $130,000 in savings annually from the debt service from this uh, transaction, which is money that's sorely needed in Barefoot Bay for capital improvements. So we're very happy. This is a, a happy item for us. Okay, do I have a um, motion to accept the proposal? Oh. Do I have a motion to accept the proposal? So moved. Have you moved back into the Board of County Commissioners from the This is a barefoot bay still? Right. No? Which one we on here? Two? Is this County Commission? I thought it was yeah. barefoot bay. I thought it was barefoot bay We're too. Doing one, I think they did one first, now they're gonna do two, so they're both barefoot bay. Haha, uh -huh, it wasn't my bad. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Smith. Do I have a second? It's the same. The second one is the board. The second one is the board. It's the same. Never mind. Can I have a motion to uh, close the Barefoot Bay meeting and to reconvene the County Commission? Second. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Barfield, second by Commissioner Art. Is Nardi all in favor say aye? Aye. Okay, welcome back, County Commission. Item 6F2. Do I have a motion? Commissioner Smith moves again. Commissioner Smith moves again. Do I have a second? Second by Commissioner Barfield. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes 5-0. Okay, we are at new business item 6F3. Commissioners, item, this item is a citizen's request for the board to waive the requirements for the minimum floor area for hotel and motel rooms in TU1 and TU2 zoning code. They are also suggesting that the board propose legislative intent and, cons and consider revising the minimum floor area of 250 square feet or minimum industrial standards and have it brought back before you within 60 days. I understand that there are some folks here that would are able to address any questions that you may have, and of course we're here to answer any questions you may have about the code. Okay, I don't believe I have any cards on this item, though. Okay, you might have to fill yeah. one out. Hold on. I'm sorry, one. Mr. Watson is here for, and um, I'm, I don't know what the other, Sam Patel, to okay. talk to him. Mr. Bade, your light's on. Is that an old light?
Is that an old light? You're on. Yeah. Your light's on. No, that was an old light. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, County Commissioners, Commissioners Nardi. A uh, comment. Um, I got a call from, uh, perhaps you guys did as well, from uh, Bruce Moya, and he wanted to be here to speak on this issue, but he thought the meeting was in the morning. So, you know, his bad, he had to go out of town. But um, from what he explained, and perhaps staff can concur, that th this is just not really a big issue as far as the waiver for the room minimum size, and that staff had, at least from what he reported, had difficult time on finding out why we had it in the first place in our code. So. Maybe the history, explain the history or explain the purpose? So I don't, I don't know that I can give you a reason for the um, minimum square footage for the hotel room. It's been in our code since 1979. Before that, it was 300 square feet. We have uh, looked at some other jurisdictions real briefly, and um, we see that hotel rooms can range from 150 square feet on the low side up to 400 square feet on, at the higher side. So I don't know that there really is an industry standard. I'm not aware of there being any minimum square footage requirement by other state agencies or anything. So. And can I ask you one more question? I mean, not that obviously we make the rules and you guys unfortunately sometimes have to follow them or, or fortunately. Um, in your professional opinion, would you suggest that we move to try to remove this from our code? the minimum hotel size requirement? I don't know that you would want to remove it, but you may want to look at what is a reasonable amount of square footage for the hotel rooms. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Tobaya. Thank you. Uh, this is before the Board of Adjustment right now, and um, they're tied. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think you know, we, we let this run its course. Uh, I think that's going to probably uh, receive a faster action than us moving forward uh, with, with this citizen's proposal. Not that I'm against it, but, uh, you know, we have, we have a course where, where um, any business can go through with this. Again, I'm not against it, but it seems as though they're circumventing, they're trying to circumvent uh, the system that we have in place and come directly to us. And, I don't know if that sets a good precedent uh, as we move forward. Mr. Knox. Yeah, to follow up on Commissioner Tobias' uh, comments, the uh, typically you can't come before the board to waive a zoning ordinance, and that's typical, and this is typical. So you can't do that. It's just you can't do it. The Board of Adjustment holds a various proceeding to consider variances for hardships. They're, they're tied at 2 to 2. There's another meeting coming up where they'll have the fifth member President, hopefully they'll make, break the tie one way or the other. What this board can do is amend the ordinance. And the, if you amend the ordinance, say, to create a range, say, between 150 and 400 square feet for, for hotels. Um, in the past, if you had unanimity on that kind of approach and the board was interested as a group to do that, we have invoked what we call the green light doctrine, which we say, basically, since you're going to do it anyway, we can look at this particular application and apply it uh, prospect. Uh, right now, pending the adoption of the ordinance, and just pr process it as though it is already done. Thank you. Commissioner Smith. Mr. Calkin, when you were looking at other counties, did, did you see that other counties have restrictions or have different restrictions or no restrictions? What we saw was that there are, we only looked at, um, six cities and all of them were within Brevard County. So we looked at the cities within our, and they, there was a, a range and they, and they varied. One city indicated that they leave it up to building review, which would indicate that they really don't have, I guess, necessarily a, a minimum square footage, but it's reviewed through the building. But the, from a zoning code standpoint, there was a, a um, variation from 150 to 400 feet. Okay, so. So, so so we haven't looked at all the the um, counties or other jurisdictions in the um, state of Florida, which we could do in the, in the interim of preparing the ordinance. I would like to to see some results from that because I'm curious. I'm a, I'm a free market guy, and but I want to protect the public at the same time. I know that 
cruise ships have very teeny tiny rooms and people spend six and seven days there. And most hotels and motels have a one night or two night unless they're in a convention. Mm -hmm. So I don't see the necessity to have a requirement that you have X number of feet. Um, and I would think that the market would adjust itself, but I don't know that for sure because I know when I stay, I call for the price. I don't say, how big is your room? No. But you know, if it's clean and it's safe, I don't care if it's 150 or 250. You know, I'm just putting my head down, going to sleep, and I'm getting up in the morning and leaving. So that's those are my thoughts. I I don't know. I don't want to stand in the way of progress, but at the same time, I want to protect the public. Yeah, I my thought is um, I I think it would be market driven. You know, in in China, I think they're like 15. They're so tiny, but it's what the market drives and the. What's been um, happening now is it's more the millennial, and they're going for the smaller rooms, compact, whatever. So I, I would actually be in favor of just getting rid of the sizes altogether and let the market drive it. I mean, if a builder is going to build something that's not going to be marketable, they're going to be. I hope they're doing better um, research and feasibility studies and that on, on what they're going to be able to sustain. So I, I would even be in favor of just um, doing a legislative intent to change the code altogether and removing it and let it be driven by the market. And um, not having to come back later if we become like China and have to make them 15. So that's just my Commissioner Znardi. I, I would agree with Commissioner Pritchett, and I'm glad you said it before I did because I think it is market driven. And I think um, I don't know that it's a public safety issue because we have safety codes in place for our building codes to cover that. And obviously, you're not wanting to build pods like they have in China, but I understand what you're trying to do. And I think that if we move forward, it. it it takes care of the bureaucracy of having you do research on 40 other cities and and it helps us actually do something efficient. So I would be in favor of that as well. And like um, Mr. Knox said, allow this um, gentleman here who obviously wants to move forward with this project. If we say that we're going to bring it back to the board with support, then can he can get, he can get the green Knox. light. Yeah, if you, if you have uh, a consensus mm -hmm. of the board that that's what you're going to do and you, and you you instruct staff to move forward with the amendment, removing the condition all altogether. And that way, he's not stuck. You can allow, on us. you can allow him to proceed as though that's happened. Okay, so I'll make a motion that we remove um, the the size restriction um, for a hotel minimum room size. Commissioner Barr, and a motion to advertise for that. Are you wanting to second, or did you have a something I'll you want? Okay, I'll second for discussion. Go ahead. I, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I have a motion on the floor to advertise in a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Passes 5-0. Now do we do a separate one for this one? Does it, we need a separate one for? Well, yeah. Why don't you include as part of that motion that the applicant that's pending, the application pending before the uh, Board of Adjustment is uh, can move forward on the basis of the proposed ordinance. Can I have amendment to your motion? I'll amend the motion. Just a second to, hold? To what Scott Knox just said. Just a second <laughs> hold with the amendment, sir. Second. I'll second it, yeah. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. You surprised me. Passes 4-1 with Commissioner to buy an objection. It has to be difficult. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Okay, we have no more public comments. We are at board reports and presentations. Congratulations, guys. Looking forward to what you do. Um, County Manager, Mr. Abate. No report. Mr. Knox. No report, Madam Chair. Commissioner Barfield. Happy New Year. No report. Commissioner Tobiah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank you for coming up with new music. I don't know if you were responsible for that, but I'm going to give you credit for that. I also want to thank you for the uh, Pledge of Civility. Again, I don't know if that it was worked. you up there, but uh, I, I like your leadership so far. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Smith. Yeah, if I'd known we could change the music, I would have had Led Zeppelin on there. <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> okay. I want to share some personal information with the public and my fellow commissioners. Uh, back in May of 17, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. And um, the irony of that wasn't lost on me because over the last three years, I've grown a beard promoting prostate cancer awareness. And this year, in fact, we raised with the directors, what, 3,000 bucks. 
So um, my urologist called me and said, well, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is, or the bad news, let me get that first. The bad news is that you have prostate cancer. The good news is that it, I sent it away to a genetics lab and it's a very non-aggressive um, type of prostate cancer. And he said, so if you do nothing, you'll probably live to be 20 years from now and maybe something else will kill you. But as young and healthy as you are, I would suggest that you research different treatments and decide on um, some kind of treatment. So I did that. I was in no hurry. I spent the summer doing that. I looked at surgery versus radiology. I looked at different radiology clinics. I went to uh, the Mayo Clinic a couple of times. I went to Cancer Treatments of America. I finally settled on a clinic in Sarasota. And uh, Sarasota, as most of you know, is about three hours away. So for the length of the treatment, I traveled back and forth to Brevard, obviously. <clears throat> and even on a few occasions, it mandated driving the three hours to the meetings and then three hours back over there. And so it got to be a bit tedious. But it was a challenge, and I believe it was what was required as a steward and a representative of the people. Uh, initially, my family and I chose not to make this information public because we did not want to fan public speculation and uh, conjecture. So I want to thank my fellow commissioners for their cooperation and allowing me to attend the meetings via phone that I could not physically attend because I was having treatments. And even though I never informed you of those things, I'm happy to report that the treatments have gone well, that the prognosis is very positive, and I look forward to getting back to business both as a commissioner and as a campaigner. So I just wanted to air those things and get that out of the way and and I guess there's been some speculation so now you don't have to speculate any longer well, thank you <laughs> I'm gonna give you a hug in the middle of a meeting <laughs> thank, thank you, you for sharing my pleasure Mr. Snardi and I wish you well and if you need anything you've got nurse at your disposal okay I got staff available if you want. yeah he's got a neurosurgeon on his staff um, completely unrelated and more administrative. I would just ask that this commission and our staff, and with all due respect to all involved, I mean, I am, and I've asked this before, you know, I've, I've brought it up a couple of times. I think I brought it up during the workshop. I believe that we do far and way too many updates on the agenda. I'm a pretty smart person. I, I like to say that right off the bat, but it's very irritating when I have to constantly go to the agenda to see an update, to see something swapped out on issues that can wait to the next meeting. Now, obviously things are pressing, that's fine, but I have 20 emails from the clerk's office or from Sally's office because she's gotta do an update, she's gotta do a replacement, she's gotta swap a, this part for that part and a PowerPoint's changed. I would just ask that we get it together. Us as a commission, I don't think the commission does it as bad as staff does, and I, I don't mean that with any disrespect. I just ask that if it's not urgent and it's not pressing, 20 updates to an agenda, six revisions, and, and it's, it's about ridiculous to try to keep up with. Because then now she's having to fuss with Novus, and she's not complained to me. I've actually kind of joked with her a few times about this, but I, I mean, I feel for her and her staff, and I think it's difficult, and it's, the public's complained because that they don't have the update, and I don't think it's fair um, to our residents that we're constantly changing the agenda. And obviously, things out of, our, out of our control, that's one thing, but I think we, need, we can do better. Okay, Frank? <laughs> Sorry. I had one other comment. Um, with regard to what I said, I've, I, my treatment consists of three separate segments. The first one was eight weeks of daily Monday through Friday uh, treatments. The second one I had two weeks off and then I had uh, another week of treatments. Then I get three months off and then I have three weeks of treatments to wrap it up. It's kind of like a mop up thing that they do. Um, and that will be at the end of February and the first two weeks of March. And then after that I'm done. Thank you, Lord. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm glad I got to speak after you were able to say that. I, I'm amazed with it. You have been incredibly strong. You have been chipper. If it would have been me, I would have been winding up here and <laughs> right in the middle of things. And I, I'm really impressed and, and that you've been through that and you were incredibly faithful to, to continue to serve here. I'm, I'm blown away with it. 
And um, you now have more of my admiration than you had before. Pretty impressed, sir. Thank you for that. Um, I have nothing to add except I think 2018 is going to be stellar. So looking forward to a good year, and I sure appreciate all you guys so much. And with that, I call this meeting adjourned. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor, and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.